I, I agree with you. I am the opposite of a coffee snob because all coffee roughly tastes the same to me. So yeah. I'm like, so I don't care that much. But once it gets to be Midwest cold, then I'm kind of like, oh, now you're even worse. <laughs> <laughs> come down to texas and take your drunk weather back north with you <laughs> yeah. dude you guys got snow down there i'm <laughs> <My> bad <laughs> uh king of the north i'll come and like bring winter with me and then retrieve it and yeah um yeah <laughs> yeah just uh, but yeah bloodborne just just kind of the final point is, is you talked about how like you're you're fighting like va like the last the vile bloods the last line of these vampires essentially arith aristocrats and you cosmic horror the way the game is constructed, though, the map design, and this is something that just mm. the other Souls games that, that none of, Sekiro, as much as I love it, and it has those moments where you're standing there. So I think that was, it's that and DS3 are their first, like, first, like full, like, you know, can be for 60 FPS, like, top of the line sort of mm, yeah. rendered games, right? Yeah. Not counting Dark Souls 2, where it could be 60 FPS if you want your equipment to break twice as fast. <laughs> right, right. Which they patched a year after the game came out. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. But, like, it's the, there's those moments in Sekiro where I'm just standing there admiring the beauty of the landscapes. Mm -hmm. and But none of them have that level design. None of them. Dark Souls once ha has one moment with the Labyrinth City once mm. like a little bit like kind of into the game uh but it's specifically like all of yarnum at all times is like that this this mm -hmm. whole just the way you're weaving through it how you can kind of miss a couple bosses double back and like how it allow how you interpret the story because which bosses you fight in what order and right yeah. if you ended up in upper cathedral like earlier than say the nightmare frontier or like all these different you're just the way you're putting your brain even constructs the story because the way this is the souls this is the from software style is you're getting a lot of the story from like what the environments look like there's no wasted effort with a statue in a corner right that, mm -hmm, that statues right. There. and what you read on like even something like just your a blood vial for a health potion or like an antidote like you're just reading the stuff that's how you're constructing the story so you, as you're physically walking through this narrative so to speak um you're it's it's changing how you even interpret the story and and that's for me what makes bloodborne so good is it's just i've played through it time and time again and i'm still like what the fuck is pale blood oh my god i thought it was this and i thought i had it nailed down but then you know and you're reading wikipedia's and you're watching videos and that was miyazaki's intent and this is very mm -hmm. similar to um uh, P, uh, PT with, with uh, Kojima, uh, mm. they envision a world where video games are even, even and especially single-player experiences are community endeavors that you... Mm -hmm. And here's going to be our segue right into the... Right into the <laughs> <laughs> right, right into the show here. This is this is how professional I am. A smooth segue, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're they're very. What makes them as video games so compelling is they envision this. You play the game, you get stumped, you go on a forum or you make a tweet on somebody's post, and then somebody tells you something, and you're and you're sort of collectively progressing through the game together. Mm -hmm. um, Sekiro does it like they all they all do that where you're you're sort of you're playing this single player game. But you're you experience the world in this this collective sense, and that's not unlike Age of Sigmar. <laughs> <laughs> so I am of course the magical Mister Mephisto, the most dangerous man in Age of Sigmar. I'm joined tonight by one of the one of the best guests in chat, gang. Sorry, <laughs> oh, stop. Oh, stop. Uh, the Doctor Alex yeah, Milones. How's it going, my friend? Going very well. Thank you for having me back. Right on, dude. And uh, this is, of course, the uh, this is episode AOS Rantcast eighty three. Uh, we're going to be doing a little. Uh, we're going to be talking about Path of Glory a little bit because you and and the Pants Mafia have a channel together now where you've been doing Pants to Glory. We have yes, yes. Pants to Glory is nearly done with season one. We have one more. We have a second finale to do. <laughs> uh, so we'll we'll be talking about that. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit, uh, kind of start off, and then we're going to transition into a little bit of a mental health checkup. Um, you mm -hmm. know, it, actually, your suggestion, and, and uh, I don't think I need to refresh anyone's memory, but but just in case they do, you have a you are a doctor of sorts, and uh, we're not here to give any official doctor advice, but you do it is your field, and you if you just want to explain it real quick, reset that. Uh, 
Absolutely. So I am a psychologist. I have my doctorate in psychology, and I'm a clinical psychologist. So I do therapy and psychological assessment. So by joining the show as a guest, you know, I'm here to talk about Age of Sigmar. I'm here to talk about my field, you know, the times that that overlaps. I am not going to give anyone any direct advice. I'm not saying you should go and do this. I am going to give some general pointers that we know from psychological research about, you know, what is helpful for people. So, you know, the, by listening to the show, you have not become my patient. You're not my client. You don't owe me anything. But hopefully we can raise some good ideas or, or some things for you to look into and maybe even follow up with your own therapist or in your own work. Right on. Right on. Yeah. So and Soren, uh, you sort you've you've been you've been you've been a guest before you were on the Rantathon. That was just fine, man. I, I've uh, I've never regretted a single guest I brought on this show. Um, I don't think I've had a bad episode. I've had episodes that have broke me, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but those are enjoyable for a different reason. Um, uh, this order this weekend, I, I am pre-ordering uh, Sigvald the uh, the Dok and Slanesh book and the Dok endless spells. I'm breaking my promise to not buy more models until I paint what I own because I need Sigvald. Lol. You know what? I think you're allowed to make an exception. Uh, this one time, <laughs> Sigvald would definitely want you to make an exception. Right. That is true. Right, and then, uh, and then uh, we're gonna t we're gonna kind of end the show uh, talking about some uh, some wacky lists, which has become a little bit of a hallmark of of Alex's uh, guest spots here. <laughs> so. And and in fact, one of them will be invalidated in the next three days. So I think that's a personal record. Um, I was. <laughs> I, I asked Brendan for some suggestions, and he was like, oh, you should do, like, a Slanesh RPG party list. And I was like, oh, oh yeah, that's an interesting idea. Oh, but I don't know that tome that well. It would take a while to build it up. And then, uh, and then oh, yeah, isn't there a book coming? Oh, I'll, I'll do this doc list I'm interested in instead. And then guess who's also getting a battle tome on the same day? Yeah. So. Uh, I, mean, I mean, just while we're on the subject, I've heard speculation that because we're seeing like a double book release, and I am the furthest from anyone who understands what Games Workshop is remotely. Doing. <laughs> I, get, I mean, so, Soren, uh, uh, one of one of the just OGs, the Mad Lad himself. Uh, you know, for the first, you know, several months of Rantcast, he would come in here. He's like, "Oh, what do you think they're going to do this box set release, or do you think?" Uh, you know the price point of this is and you know i'd get comments like that on my early videos and i'm like i don't do that <laughs> like it's just not that like um but but i do think that like everyone understands that games workshops a little bit under the gun uh this last year for obvious reasons mm -hmm. um it all you know from 10 cent with their you know some of their terrain kits and stuff like that it started even before covid they're having some mm. issues with, with brexit uh in do it's sure. like the Indominus box set, they they had a healthy projection. They're like, we're going to sell, uh, we think we're going to sell this much. We're going to sell X. Let's mm -hmm. produce 2X. And the demand was for 4X. So even yeah. though they, they did, and then that just, that bottleneck some of their supply lines and COVID hits. Um, and I think seeing that the two books are coming out, I do think that they're trying to, this is my own personal speculation. Mm. Uh, I do think that they're trying to like, get caught back up to release two point or three point on time. That's my tinfoil hat here when I see two books come two books, two armies coming out at the same time. Yeah, for sure. I think that's not an unfair speculation. As a mental health professional, I would challenge the entire Age of Sigmar community to use Games Workshops release methods as an exercise in coping with uncertainty. Because <laughs> who knows what the hell they do. So everybody Let's all just let's tolerate the ambiguity and the uncertainty together. We yeah. are all on this wild ride. And you know what? I've been on this ride since I, I started uh, playing Age of Sigmar, you know, a few years back, thinking, oh, I wonder I wonder when they'll release whatever faction Malekith is going to be in now that he's Malarian. It's 2021 and we're still waiting. So <laughs> healthy dose of tolerance for ambiguity, everybody. Umbraneth will come. At least we've got a word for him. Now. Yeah, yeah. There, we, we know that there's a word for them. I mean, it's it's interesting because I feel very fortunate. I played a, I you know I jumped in in uh, you know right at the tail end of 1.0 with GHP 2017. Uh, as I was making up my mind to play the game, basically, and as I was like collecting models and uh, you know playing practice games with Haywo, um, they released the LON Battle Tome and just kind of like 
pr- they just like like just like congratulations, like welcome to <sighs> Age of Sig- like here's your reward. Uh, here's updated Nagash rules. Like here's all the stuff you wanted to play. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. Like here's all the shit like I remember from when I started Warhammer Fantasy Battle, made kind of new and kind of cool, sweet. Like I was rewarded, and then like they nerf that. Kind of the following year, like, just into the ground with the next GHB. Just destroy it. And then, like, right around the corner, Osiric Bone Reapers come out. And I'm like, ooh, okay, all right, I forgive you, Games Workshop. Like, and then, like, (laughs) and, like, I've gotten tragically few games in with my Bone Daddies. Mm. I mean, I did get in a a tournament. Uh, I got, you know, some scrims and stuff like that. But, like, I mean, this this last year was going to be my year for just, like, grind and games and tournaments with, with Bone Daddies and, like, laughing and playfully throwing money at Games Workshop because of how <laughs> much I enjoy the army. And, um, you know, that sucks. We're all kind of going through it. You know, we all got kind of quarantined and whatnot. Um, no. but, th- but then something happened at the beginning of the year, which is we saw S- Soul Soul Blight, the new, the Grave Lords, <laughs> and I'm just like, like uh, once more, Games Workshop. So meanwhile, you your entire Age of Sigmar career has been like, man, one day they're gonna release Malekith, and I'm just like, every year, Games Workshop <laughs> just hands me candy, and I did nothing to deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I I think after that first year, I I learned like, okay, this is this is a long haul thing. It will be nice when it comes, but you know, you're you're just gonna have to. It happens when it happens, and. Who knows? It could be. It could be next year. It could be next month. It could be five years from now. You might be getting ready for retirement, and they'll be like, "Hey, Games Workshop is releasing that Malarian model they've been talking about." And I'll be like, "Oh, really? I have so much time to play now." Well, it's it's. I mean, it's it's so. I mean, it's 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 it is a battle of expectations, and I think that's mm-hmm. that's just life in general. You gotta do something with your expectations, or you're gonna live a pretty rocky, tumultuous. Like roller coaster of 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 getting it hyped for something and being upset. Mm-hmm. See, my strategy is to just hype myself up in, <laughs> into the hyperbolic like stratosphere, to where nothing can meet my expectations. <laughs> and since I am so like hyped, the opposite effect happened. You would think that like I would have the hardest crash possible. No, what actually happens <laughs> is my is the the vacuum created from where my expectations are and what reality is is so pronounced <laughs> that I like psh, like I level out immediately and snap into place with like supreme clarity and vision. This is my technique. <laughs> <laughs> that or I just don't care. Like I like I hype things up, but like I just don't care. Like I what what I heard a great quote from somebody the other day. It was something like, "I have, you know, it, like, what is it?" expect nothing appreciate everything right like mm. you know like I, and, go ahead i think i think uh rex from mass effect actually sums this real up really well in one of his quotes that i it has always stuck with me when asked how things are going it's like better than i feared worse than i hoped <laughs> yeah yeah i mean th- that's that's the thing is like you have you know that that balance between like what you ex- it's 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 enjoyable to have hope Right, like this is this mm-hmm. is a, this is a great one of those great human experiences to hope for something. Like it's right. Um, it's it's good to have that, but you gotta like, but there's there's that like crash when you hope for something that doesn't happen. So you gotta like temper. That's the thing you gotta temper for. You gotta buffer. I hope this happens, but I'm not expecting it to. And I think that that's the way I kind of approach stuff. Like I hope for this. Like with vampires, I I would have been like with you with Umberneth. We're just mm. five years of not of like saying they're coming one day and not <laughs> truly caring. Not not that I didn't truly care, but like not like banking my enjoyment of the game on whether they exist mm-hmm. or not. Um, so we we have a a good concept actually in positive psychology that taps into this distinction here, mm-hmm. which is the difference between hopefulness and wishfulness. Ooh, okay. With, with hopefulness is the ability to envision a better and brighter future, as well as the practical steps to get you there. Whereas wishfulness is just denial of reality and wanting it to be different than it actually is. That's actually, that's an exact descriptor of, of some of the disconnect, I think, uh, between people's expectations and 
hopefully I'm I'm gonna hang on to that. This is gonna this is because yeah. this is now rant cast canon. Like I'm gonna re uh, reshape my own vernacular to distinguish between hopefulness and wishfulness. So uh, yeah, look at that. This is so, what, this is what happens when you bring doctors on your show. You get smarter. <laughs> <laughs> I am here to deliver the info and to help all of you manage your expectations when Games Workshop inevitably dashes them. Oh man, just but, destroyed. <laughs> but this is, <laughs> this is this is an approach that we we find is really helpful, especially when we're dealing with ambiguity. Is that you know you have to try to envision that brighter future, but there has to be something concrete that you can do. And it's okay if that's a small thing. You know, those small steps are how we actually get to some of those bigger things. Mm -hmm. But if there's nothing you can actually do, you just want things to be different than they are, then, yeah, that is wishfulness. And it's fair to say, yeah, this sucks. I really wish this was different. But you can't dwell in that space. There's right. there's not a lot of good that comes from dwelling there. Right. And Travis actually here, and uh, Kicker here in chat, gang, like, like he got hyped – hype for vampires too and uh mm -hmm. like he just started making his own <laughs> like, just, like, like and and so that was i think that's pretty cool when you have you do have this hobby i think that's one of the advantages of this is you can take some agency in what you want to see in the game um i think more so than like 40k um you mm -hmm. know the sort of big brother to our game or big sister or whatever like the the actual ability to like put yourself on the table and be like okay like i'm i'm not getting this new thing that I want. Well, I'm, you know what, I'm, I'm going to sculpt it. Like, what's an army that plays mm -hmm. the way I kind of want to, or, like, that has some parallels visually with it, and, you know, and I'm just going to make it that. And the Mortal Realms themselves sure. are so big that you, there's nobody to tell you that that doesn't, that doesn't exist. You know, like, right. it's, it's so big, of course that thing that you just made could exist somewhere. So I'd right, like... absolutely. And I think that's one of the great creative things we see in our hobby is when people who are saying, you know, oh, Grop Bag Scholars were mentioned once or they showed up in Silver Tower and a Games Workshop might make an army of them. But you know what? Screw it. I'm going to make my own. I got green stuff. I got goblin models. I'll make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going I'm not going to wait, you know, I'm not going to wait around for Games Workshop because like D6 said earlier on, um like waiting, you know, betting on Games Workshop releases, you know, just like yeah. oof. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think this is perfectly encapsulated in the meme that's gone around Twitter lately of people saying like, oh, man, I love how this model has evolved in the time I've been in the hobby. And it's just seven pictures of the same Eldar Guardian model with like fifth edition, sixth edition, seventh, eighth, ninth. And it's been it's been how long it's been more than a decade since they updated some of these models. Yeah. I think that's one of the great things about being an Age of Sigmar fan is we get these new and dynamic models. And for 40k, it seems like if you're not a Space Marine fan, like you're you might get someone, someone else in the lore might get a new range once every couple of years. Yeah, I, I don't talk about 40k much because it's it's a funnier joke to be like, what's 40k? Um, right. <laughs> I played Blood Angels, you know, basically forever um, uh, in 40k, and I had a a Dark Eldar army that I kind of inherited when my buddy got mm -hmm. out of it. Um, I had that second edition Dark Eldar Codex. I still have it somewhere. Second edition, <laughs> all the way into sixth edition. They didn't even get a new book. You let alone <laughs> like new freaking models. Are you kidding me? Like it's true. That that is that is like a hallmark of old games workshop, isn't it? Of like what edition is it and how old is my book? Yeah. How you, many editions back am I? Yeah, you and your 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 book is like it's like Darth Vader, like he's more post it note than man now, because you just have like little <laughs> fucking yeah. post it notes. Or at least I did, like just post it notes all over like the stuff that they change in like a white dwarf or whatever. And like just yeah. like this is this is it. And uh, I remember the, see the see the current gloom spite gets battle tome, where the second half of the book is now just three white dwarfs. <laughs> like you just you perform surgery, like you cut out yeah. and just like glue them in like over the other pages. <laughs> to tear out path to glory and just shove this in. Yeah. There we go. There, yeah, just Got take... a usable tome. <laughs> just tear out the in, path. in the right spot anyway. Yes. I think one of the funniest things actually about this upcoming Daughters of Cain release is that this is the first time I have ever said, I'm excited to see what's in Path to Glory. Really? And that's, on and that's only because we are doing Pants to Glory and I'm doing Daughters of Cain for season two. See, we have a really easy segue right here. 
but screw that. It's time to read but, chat. Um, no, screw it. <laughs> this is, we're now going to the chunky peanut butter transition. Yeah. We're no longer sputtery smooth. Yeah, right. Uh, Razor Tree here says, I can't afford Umberneth and Lumineth releases close to each other, um, but I would still welcome it. That's kind of how I felt about, like, vampires. I'm like, I'm actually, like, I'm, like, hyping up vampires and Soulblood. I'm like, but please don't release them next year. Please don't release them because I need to save money. Um, like, uh, like, you could get a comfortable, like, comfortable releases. They need to get, like, a nice, nice, comfortable rotation down. Uh, between mm. like the grand alliances and stuff like that, like okay, yeah, you get destruction, you get order, you get death, you get chaos, and just like a nice little like p- nicely spaced out, and they just go into rotation. Um, maybe they. I do give this. them. Go ahead. Go ahead. I give them credit for the fact that I think around uh, 2017, 2018, we used to have a joke that every rumor engine was new Stormcast, but after Second Edition came out, that has not been the case at all. Yeah. And so in Age of Sigmar, it does seem like we do have a rotation. It's not like every release is also a Stormcast release. That, like, we actually haven't gotten much new Stormcast stuff until uh, Broken Realms Marathi. Yeah, I, I'm actually a little uh, bothered by that. Like, I, I, I'm not a Stormcast player, but I am a little bit of a... a I'd say I'm like a... I, I, I back Stormcast. I think they're a, like mm. a, a great... Uh, hero slash foil for this story. I think they're really, really solid. Um, and so I'm like, I'm like, wait a second. They actually haven't gotten anything new in a while. I'm just like looking around, like, like I, this feels wrong. Like this feels odd. <laughs> <laughs> like it's like walking into your house and someone rearranged your furniture. All the furniture right. is there, <laughs> but like it's just not in the but right place. Find- <laughs> But then you find that really comfy chair, and you're like, "All oh, right, Star Drakes." <laughs> Don't uh, worry, everyone. Two of the lists tonight are Stormcast lists. Yeah, there we go. So, so we're getting some. Stormcast. So there's your sneak peek. Yeah. Nice, nice tease. That's good. in the biz. It's called a tease. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Soren getting caught up on what he needs to paint. Um. More post-it note than man now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you feel free to use that. <laughs> yeah, right. See, also, uh, edition one Zinch Battle Tomes at Age of Sigmar. At the end of the day, you didn't even bring the book. You just brought the FAQ and other post-it notes attached to it. Yeah. It wasn't even worth having the book anymore. Right, right, right. All right, so you're really excited. You mentioned you're really excited for, for Path of Glory and the new Marathi book um, mm-hmm. because DOK. I guess I, I just – I always skip over the Path to Glory section in Battle Tomes. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just – it's inconveniently – between all the like the the fluff and the lore and all the stuff I like to read, and then like the War Scrolls, the thing that uh, I need to internalize, um, mm-hmm. even though sometimes they're wrong, and then you have to scrub the memory and then go read the FAQ <laughs> and, and fix it. But um, what is Path to Glory like for people who maybe sure. are like me and just have already ripped that section out to put a white dwarf in there? Um, right. <laughs> yeah. So. So Path to Glory, and I think that maybe the rationale behind why it is where it is, Path to Glory is meant to be a sort of introduction for players who are new to the army as a way to build up and slow grow your army while while, while playing with friends who are doing the same with their army and then gradually get attached to the characters in the units by giving them some special abilities that match abilities in the battle tome, but... You know, you maybe get a little bit more flexibility or, or a little bit more uniqueness by being able to attach them to different characters or different units. And so you can go very narratively heavy and, like, name every unit, name every hero, and which Games Workshop encourages you to do. Um, or you can just see it as a preliminary, like, okay, I'm not playing a 1,000-point game because I don't have enough, but I can play a 400-point game with some of these units. So, now, go oh, go ahead. So it's, now the we're gonna do this is like yeah, the no okay. you go no I'll go no, no I'll no, go no, but no, you so go please the, carry on you the licorice conversational trick basically uh, Necrolepsy <laughs> with a tier one sub for seventeen years says hey hey Necrolepsy how's it going my friend um <laughs> yeah uh, so it reminds me of like actually it, it, it's codifying a way that my friend Sam and I who's the one I grew up a lot like grew up with playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle in like the sixth grade seventh grade eighth grade. Um, you know, you're very slowly, like, getting together some stuff. Right? You don't have, like, mm-hmm. a whole army. Um, but you want to play games. And, right, right. And so pa- Path of Glory kind of is, like, is that, as you're kind of building an army and familiarizing yourself, it's that, like, nice little uh, ramp up 
Um, it's 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 weird because people are like they people constantly talk about how you know they want the kill team, they want the kill team for Age of Sigmar, and I know we've got Warcry now, but is Path to Glory mm-hmm. like kind of actually already? It's already been here, and it already kind of has been our our kill team introductory game style. Do you think? I think I think um, skirmish was meant to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but didn't quite catch on. I think the rules weren't quite tight enough. You know, I, me and, and Christian played that in one day. We went to Grognard Games and played out an entire skirmish campaign in a day and got some funny stories from it, but also there were just some glaring issues we ran into. It's closer to, I think, what they have now with Crusade in 40K. That idea of you gradually build up a force, you give that force some special extra character to them, but that also helps to introduce you to maybe some of the fun Minor mechanics in the battle tome. Um, so, for instance, if you take the the new Zinch battle tome and their Path to Glory rules, most of those are rules that exist in other areas in the tome. But rather than give you all of your allegiance abilities, instead you're earning them kind of piecemeal along the way with different units to help you learn and experiment with them on a more sort of limited, narrow scale. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's an interesting part of it, is that they often limit what allegiance abilities you get. You'll get the broad strokes one, but you'll often not get some others like sub-factions. Okay. Okay. So, and and of course, you're, I mean, you the, the Pants Mafia crew is, is one of the most, I want to say veteran groups. I mean, you've been around the tournament scene in the Midwest for as long as, even before I can remember. Um, veteran in age, not necessarily in skill, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Right. We are the line from Biloxi Blues of uh, you go to the veterans hospital. You know, you become a veteran. You don't get to come back. It's like that's that's where where we're at in terms of our veterancy. Well, for me anyway. Kyle is is I would argue a better player than I am, and Christian far better than both of us. So, <laughs> well, I mean, what what I was saying is like you're not playing this as as the introduct as an introductory thing. You guys are doing this this for kicks and recording it on youtube and by the way you've been winning the shirt game i've been i've been scoring <laughs> shirts, uh which is uh both antithetical to your name <laughs> which also makes it well <laughs> well if you if you ha- if you have an entire youtube channel and the only thing you see are pants and you know crotch down shots youtube gets a little squiffy <laughs> about that they get a little worried yeah so yeah the the shirt game is actually the strong part in the pants mafia videos <laughs> But I appreciate that you found a game within the game. Yeah, yeah. Like, you've been winning the shirt game, though. So, I, I like, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, you guys are, you know, veteran players. So, you're not just playing this as, like, a new thing. Like, you, you had a, at least a, a, a K of Zinch or even two K of Zinch before uh, doing the, the pa- Pants to Glory. Because you, you started with Zinch, as I recall. Um, mm-hmm. Kyle was doing his, one of his bare things. I don't, I don't know. City. Kyle, Kyle is <laughs> technically doing a Tempest Eye Cities of Sigmar list, but it is an entirely, con- well, not entirely converted. It is all dwarf infantry, and then all of the cavalry are converted dwarves riding bears. Yeah, yeah, which is pretty sweet. Like, uh, is, is, are they, temp- is he using the Tempester War Scroll, and they're like bear cavalry type thing? Is that what's going on? Tempester? Is- I, I think his current army has pistoliers, so, you know, dwarfs with two pistols riding bears. Right. Um, he just added um, demigriff knights, who are dwarves on bigger bears. <laughs> and I believe and I believe his plan is to add a dwarf riding a giant bear as a general on griffin, which from the Pants to Glory table you can't actually get because he started with a different general, but we're allowing it because why not? So you're you're like uh you're you're doing a little bit of a whose line is it any anyway th- uh thing where you're you're kind of uh, the points are made uh what is it the the rules are made up and the points don't matter like you've you've changed so, some of it a little bit <laughs> oh absolutely we've completely overhauled the system because here's the weakness to Path to Glory is it is not balanced from book to book and we've seen how good of a job Games Workshop does at balancing their game normally. So now imagine when you've got this other sub rule set that isn't nearly as popular, it you know, your odds go straight out the window. Right. So Chris, we decided to set out on Path to Glory as a way to hold ourselves accountable during COVID to keep up with the hobby and, and try to get some games in, especially since we, we all were comfortable sort of being in our in our game bubble where right. we've all know that we've all been safe and so we're comfortable meeting up in person. Yeah. Um, but when we started looking at the books and comparing notes, and Christian was the one who did, who did the job of sort of compiling all that data, they are wildly different from book to book. You know, with my Zinch book, 
I, no matter what hero I picked, I got five follower rolls. And when I made those rolls, the number of points that my army was worth would be anywhere from about 600 to up to like 1400 points. Mm -hmm. And then he, uh, a Nurgle army got far fewer rolls and at max hit about 600 points. So imagine rocking up to the table and you've both followed Path to Glory straight from the book and your friend has more than twice the army that you do. So, so how did he compensate? Was it like a like a handicap type situation where you got to like fill in the points differential? Like what what was the solution you guys came up with? So Christian basically overhauled the entire rule set in terms of progression and then through the games that we had we gave him feedback and we kind of further refined it. So how we wound up doing it is that you got to make your rolls, but rather than that determining what was in your army, that determined what unit options you had available. So rather than it saying, oh, I rolled Pistoliers, so now I add five Pistoliers to my army list, it's I rolled Pistoliers, so now I can choose to add Pistoliers to my army, and then we all had the same number of points based on what round we were in. I see. So... So when we played all of our games round one, we had 600 points. So if you had rolled Pistoliers, that could be five Pistoliers, that could be 20 Pistoliers, if you really wanted to do that. Um, and then the, in round two, we went up to 800 points, and then 1,000, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then as we also had our own sort of player levels, which we earned by achieving different objectives, and then that gave us access to more follower roles for more options, or upgrade roles to give bonuses to heroes and units. Right. Right, and that that is one of the cool features of Path to Glory. Is it feels a little bit like an RPG, where like you'll mm -hmm. you'll have like your kind of hero that's like progressing and gaining loot and abilities as the as as you progress through the Path of Glory. So that that part is fun, I think, about Path to Glory. Um, and it creates some really interesting stories too. Whether you're you're doing more narrative stories or whether you're just you know playing with your friends. I started off with a unit of Zangor on foot with the soul burn ability, which makes it so every time they roll a six to hit, they do a mortal wound in addition. Mm -hmm. And Zangor, uh, the base Zangor, have a lot of different attacks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can, if there are nine or more models in the unit, they get an extra attack. Through a Zinch, one of our hidden agendas, you can give them their entire unit an extra attack. Through one of the endless spells, you can give them an extra attack. Yeah. So that unit became the absolute bane of Christian and Kyle for the first few <laughs> rounds because they they run. I can auto-run them six with Destiny Dice. They get to run and charge. I can auto-charge them 12 with Destiny Dice. Yeah. So they clear 24 inches across the table, and then they jump on you and just wipe out whatever they hit. Yeah. yeah. So those Zangor with Soulburn were single-handedly what carried me through a lot of the early games of the campaign. Well, and... And you're you're actually you said you're closing out your season of Path to Glory, or Pants to Glory, um, Pants to Glory, yes, <laughs> TM like <laughs> trademark, T T Pants to Glory, <laughs> yeah. Um, you you actually uh you were kind of in control of your destiny at the end appropriately, and and we've you've got one game left to go, right? Like to close out the season, is that what it is, or one? Correct. So I I could have won the whole thing in the last game, but unfortunately I did not win that game. So it goes to another, which is now anyone's game. Yeah. So it, it essentially reset the bracket. Like you were in the you were in the winners the winners bracket, like with sole control. And then very Zinchian of you to like, <laughs> <laughs> like to just just as planned yourself into having to like <laughs> win a second time rather than just win outright. <laughs> yes, yes, it was just as planned. Correct. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Right. Except yeah. no other alternative narratives about this. <laughs> uh, but yes, I I have been in the lead throughout much of it, um, and Kyle was was kind of falling behind, uh, and so. We had initially had it set up so that player level was what determined the number of points you got. But by the end of round one, we realized I was going to be like 200 points ahead of Christian and 400 points ahead of Kyle, which seemed like an insurmountable thing for him to catch up with. That was when we decided to instead do the bracketed points. And then the player levels just gave you access to some more flexibility in your options, like artifacts or special abilities or things like that. Right, right. So my army might have had more upgrades, but it was the same number of points as Kyle's army or Christian's army. Christian took Lumineth into this. So we had Lumineth, we had Zinch Arcanites, not Zinch Demons, and then we had Kyle doing Cities of Sigmar Tempest Eye. So, I mean, and here's a... 
an interesting premise that, that just sort of in the broader AOS, AOS context that I think you've kind of stumbled upon, like like you've almost been doing case study. Um, mm-hmm. Do points actually? I know we have a lot of discussion about points in Age of Sigmar as like you know points up and down. Do points really fix things? You're finding mm-hmm. that points really were the best litmus test or the best main gauge, not the variance and the abilities and the force multipliers that you can get from that you that range of stuff. Points have been the the throttle mechanism. Like I think what what we realized was that when points went out of bounds, it became very difficult for another player to catch up, which we each had realized from playing regular Path to Glory before. That you know, it was sort of a win more condition. Whoever wins the first game or two gets propelled so far along that it becomes very difficult for anyone to catch up. Mm-hmm. By equalizing the number of points available, it didn't necessarily mean that Kyle now had a, a, a completely perfect shot. You know, he struggled during the first few rounds of the game, but at least it wasn't because he couldn't put enough army on the table. Right. He could. It was just, you know, getting the choices he needed, getting the combinations right. he needed in order to make it happen. Like he uh he wanted to get rune lords and and iron drakes and he got the iron drakes, but we're about to finish out the campaign and he has yet to get the rune lord <laughs> to really bring the combo. Meanwhile, I may I I didn't cheat, but I didn't realize it may not have been in in the spirit of things. We decided on the roles we got based off what the book tells you. And the book tells you, oh, you can sac- you can trade a roll for an upgrade, and you can just choose it. So I was like, Zangor, Soulburn, perfect, this is great. Mm-hmm. But not realizing that Christian and Kyle had done all of their upgrades randomly. I see, yeah. So uh, what we have decided on going forward is that it will be all random all the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, we'll we'll see how that works out. Like my, my doc army, I have figured out for Season 2, I have Life Takers, I have Stalkers, which are the Malusai with the bows, and a Medusa. None of the typical core <laughs> units in a Daughters of Cain army. My melee unit is the most fragile melee unit in their book. So, uh, so yeah, by going all random, uh, you can get some wacky combinations, or you can get exactly what you need. I, as you're talking, I'm, I'm just, I'm. It feels very Blood Bowl esque to me. <laughs> like it does. It's a, if you go all random, it definitely has that element. Yeah, it feels like a Blood Bowl roster ask to me because you're they they've changed this in in 3.0 um, or I guess the third season or whatever they're calling the new Blood Bowl. They've changed this in in Blood Bowl 2020 uh, now where it's a lot more uh, purposeful uh, mm. roster construction. But before with like Blood Bowl two and stuff, you're just you're just at the mercy of the dice for what abilities you get leveling up, and you have this sort of like ideal trajectory, but you. Sometimes you just end up with plus strength on a skink. Um, yeah. <laughs> you got to roll with it. Right? right. Yeah. Like, and, and some, some additions to your roster just don't work unless you get the double, like right. dark elf assassins seem like such a cool idea, but unless you roll a double early and get double block, everyone's like, no, nah, bend him, yep. bend him, retire him right now. He's useless. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Blood Bowl 2020, you can roll randomly at a cheaper SPP cost or pay the SPP to pick. Yeah. Yeah, so there's still oh. that random in it. Yeah. Thanks, Frank. Nice. Um, so <laughs> so by doing this, uh, by making these adjustments and playing them out, we found that it's been, it's been much more interesting and it's felt much more competitive. Um, certainly, I will allow Kyle and Christian, when they in- inevitably join us on the show, to share their experiences. Kyle may feel a bit differently since he was <laughs> at, at the back of the pack for a bit. But now, like in our last game, uh, Kyle was very much in a strong position the whole game, was like, yeah, come at me. I don't think he lost a single unit, and Christian and I were effectively tabled by the end of the game. <laughs> so, you know, he may have been a li- bit of a late bloomer, but now he's got a unit of Iron Drakes with two wounds apiece. And I'm here with my very fragile Arcanites army thinking like, uh, how, how do, how remove this unit of this staunch line of dwarves with guns? <laughs> so, um, just, just for like, uh, people who, who haven't maybe caught Pants to Glory, are you actually playing like, you're playing like th- three, uh, like 1v1v1, like you're actually playing a three-way matchup, or are you playing, because so, I've, in, well, I, I, I won't answer it for you. Um, how are we, you, how are we, you doing that? We started doing that only for the finale. So the finale has been a free for all, but other but in all other rounds it's been a one v one and making sure that everyone got a chance to play two games. So you, you kinda of round round robin it 
round to round, like round one, round two, round three, you were, uh, you know, made sure that like the whole the whole pants fought each other in a one one on one context. And now that you're kind of moving into the finale, they've gone into multiplayer these multiplayer these three person games. Um, Correct. So me with my Zinch Arcanite's army had to play effectively a two v one against Lumineth and uh, and um, I'm completely blanking on the name for dwarves. For the like stock standard dwarves, dispossessed. Um, dispossessed. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, it was basically a two v one, and uh, because I was the only one who was in a winning position in our last game, the other two couldn't. They just had to prevent me winning. So guess who wound up being everyone's <laughs> favorite opponent yeah. every turn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's funny because I mean this is um this is where like I like about uh, the only format of Magic the Gathering I play anymore is is EDH or or um commander is is i guess a more accepted term now um and in it, there's that like moment where like the, there's almost like a the secondary equalizer when you're in multiplayer games like that which uh is the the sort of like the dog pile like if somebody brings an unfair like a truly unfair deck t- in edh you're gonna watch the whole pod like three people <laughs> just pounce and just destroy that one like OP deck, and so it kind of like keeps it. It kind of keeps people honest. This is why I think EDH is like the 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 gentleman's format, like the mm. like the nobility's format of uh, <laughs> of of, 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 uh, of Magic the Gathering and multiplayer, whether it's two v two like you know pairs or um you know the the team style where you're you're. Uh, you know, tra- essentially trading lists and stuff like that, or, mm-hmm. um, or something that's a one v one v one, like a battle royale scenario. These formats, if my Mephisto agenda for the evening, they're mm-hmm. a lot of fun, and I wa- I I encourage people to start playing them a little bit more. Uh, whether mm. again two v two, one v one v one, battle royale. Like if you can fit four people on a table at a thousand points and. At just everyone's brawling you can have a lot of fun that way um especially if you get uh if you get players who are pretty pretty effective and pretty efficient in their turns mm-hmm. you might think adding these extra people would slow it down but you know if you can get through your turn fairly quickly then it, it moves at a nice pace yeah and uh and it was also interesting because we broke out the triumph and treacheries rules, or at least half of them. We didn't use some of the more like feels bad ones where it's just like, no, you just can't attack me this turn. I'm like, well, but, but why? But well, I use treachery points. I'm like, well, but why? <laughs> uh, we just used the, the sort of way that they rotated of having to declare an enemy in each phase. And then you can only negatively impact your enemy. Mm-hmm. And the other player becomes a neutral party who you basically ignore and do nothing to. Mm-hmm. And that created some interesting dynamics there too. Of okay, I you know I could move up to this position, and that will put me in range of Kyle's pistoliers. But am I going to be his enemy in his turn, or you know what turns will I be his enemy in? He might move his pistoliers up and shoot me in a shooting phase, but then charge Christian's unit in his charge phase and declare them to be his enemy. Then so then hit both of us, mm-hmm. or, and so it just creates this other layer to it of trying to figure out. You know, I need to be prepared for each phase individually, not just for broadly. Okay, here's what my opponent's going to do in their in their turn. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I just while we're on mentioning pace, uh, the videos you guys uh, actually shoot for your your pants to glory, uh, you go with a, what I I refer to as like the short format. Um, you're not mm-hmm. you're not showing out like the entire turns. So you want to take us through like the decision making on that and and why you go with that sort of I guess faster pace or that shorter form uh, battle plan. Or a battle log. Sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. I, I think Christian could probably speak to that a little bit more because he was the one who did the initial video editing and made the judgment call there. Mm-hmm. But I think the general idea was it's a bit easier for people to consume that kind of content. Yeah. And it's also less work to try to edit. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's just easier and more straightforward on all levels. So for something that we were trying out and just wanted to to do for fun, that just brought the bar down of of what we were expecting and what people would consume. And especially since we were introducing some things like a path to glory system people may or may not have been familiar with, that we had Lumineth on the table who are brand new. Yeah, at the time, um, especially wanted... when you first started this thing, I, like I, I think that no. was one of the first games I'd seen Lumineth on a table in the, in a battle battle report. Like, was your pants to glory stuff? 
It's, it's yeah. like, it feels like it was like one entire year ago that you started this journey. <laughs> um, I know, right? Yeah, it, it definitely <laughs> has been. It, it's been a, a while. It's been an effort. Yeah. Um, but I think we wanted that idea of you could tune in, you have 10 minutes, you'll be able to see how the game goes, we'll hit the highlights for you. You don't necessarily have to watch every single dice roll. And some people want that, and, and that's fine, but we decided... You know, that just wasn't the route we wanted to go in. Yeah, I, th I think there's a, a good balance to be struck as as people uh, sort of find their voice with their battle reports. Um, I know uh, just talking to Christian just sort of ambiently that um, mm. he, he really like kind of likes the Doom and Darkness style of, of mm -hmm. it. And I know he tried to emulate that a little bit in it. And uh, I, I think it's a good direction to go. Uh, I like to see some dice rolls, though. You know, priority mm -hmm. rolls is a, is a big one. Um, charge uh, important charge rolls I think is a big one personally uh, but but a lot of other dice rolls are like okay I don't need to see you roll every attack right like that's just right like, you know this you, you know how much damage happened here maybe if it's like okay I I have an unlikely I have my one hero left right like that the mm -hmm. wizard bonk right like this wizard has <laughs> to kill <laughs> right. three Zangor with the staff which means I have to hit wound and get the three and then you got to fail all three uh, like saves like that's a tense moment like I have to do this that's that stuff's like always engaging but like okay here's like 60 or, you know here's 40 skeletons attacking 120 times I don't I don't need to see that <laughs> yeah no one needs to see me with my three Tupperware Zangor dice system trying to figure out and make sure that I'm successfully tracking how to use Zangor on foot Games Workshop if you're listening this is why people don't like to use Zangor on foot because it feels like using plague monks back in the day they're a pain in the ass, and they're not fun. Right. So, sim so next time you do a Zinch overhaul, look at Zangor on foot. Just make them simpler. We'll all be okay. But don't you dare touch that totem. You leave that totem ability. <laughs> I will not have my 40 mortal wound Zangor MSU build taken from me. You hear me, Games Workshop? <laughs> Glad we had this little chat. Yeah, they watch. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh. Yeah. <laughs> Shoutouts to the totem keyword. <laughs> we'll take my ornate totems from my cold dead hands. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the pa pace of the vid. Um, I had another question in there, uh, but I completely blanked on it. Oh, my gosh. Um, about the important roles? About the it wasn't about the important roles. It was uh, something you were saying before the before we mentioned pace, uh, before I asked about the decision there. Um, so you're going to finish off your season here, uh, with, with mm -hmm. the, the next video, uh, what clip have you kind of found yourself, like you found yourself getting in a rhythm. Uh, I know that this has been, I mean, you said it earlier on that this was kind of just something to keep y'all honest, keep y'all playing mm -hmm. despite everything. And you have your trusted bubbles. I mean, this is doing something productive, right. With your time and, and trying to stay engaged and connect to humans. Uh, I think this is, this is worthy um mm -hmm. <laughs> you know this is a worthy pursuit um what yeah. you know, roughly like your release schedule how like are you mm -hmm. do, how do you plan that out do you you're balancing three schedules in instead of just two um is it like your this is priority number one every other week what mm -hmm. how, are you, how does that like the logistics of that come together to to do something like this that part has been really difficult uh courtesy of covid because you know we might have a weekend where we've all set it aside it's all good to go we'll meet we'll play and ideally, we would do the next game in two weeks. But, you know, I'm going into the office to see a client one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, well, then we don't have that Saturday. And Saturday was the only day we found generally worked pretty well for everyone. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, Kyle was helping a family member move. And so we would have to wait two weeks from then. Or, you know, I was going, me and my wife were going to visit family. And so we'd have to wait two weeks from then. Or, you know, Christian was generally the most available, but sometimes... You know, we would try to figure out, oh, maybe another day will work this week, but he has his own obligations. So that really was the most challenging one, trying to work around everyone's schedules, but also to make sure that we were being safe. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So I, I think we probably managed one a month and some there may have been a month in there where we managed to get it done a little bit more frequently. Right, right. And uh, so, so do you have like already like a like a you don't do like a shooting schedule? Then it really is just kind of more of a play by ear type, yeah. Stuff. Essentially, yeah, we just ch touch base and see. Okay, what is the next weekend, the next Saturday that we can all comfortably say will work? And with the exception of this finale, where you kind of had this the bracket reset, you have an understanding going into Path to Glory. This is just the uh, the format. You know, it's going to be X rounds because you you plan that that at the beginning, so you know, hey, we're going to have this many games. 
Right. And that was something that we created as some flexibility, too, of, you know, OK, if something comes up and a Saturday doesn't perfectly work for everyone, you know, can me and Kyle get a game in and then Christian will join us later? Or, you know, maybe Christian and Kyle can meet up during the week because I tend to work later and they tend to be done around a, a more regular time. So maybe they meet up a weekday evening or something like that. Right. Um, but we tried to keep it so that, you know, we knew when the next the next one was going to be and then tried to keep everyone on board as best we could. Right on, right on. Um, I guess uh, the, the big the big question then, uh, do you recommend like people embracing Path to Glory a little bit more? Like, do you do you think this is a format that's underrepresented? Do you think this is a format that's got some legs? What do you what are your, what are your thoughts on that? What's the soapbox moment about Path to Glory here? Uh, I think if you embrace the Christian Weir Better Path to Glory TM system, <laughs> then uh, then it can be a a really a really fun and enjoyable route to take. Yeah, right on. So, um, <laughs> so I think if you take a look at the rules and and try to make some modifications there to make it feel more fair, to make it feel a bit more balanced, I definitely think it can have legs, especially if you and and some friends want to maybe dip your toes into an army, you know, buy a start collecting box and, and go from there. Uh, I think this can be a good format and it can also make you feel really attached to certain units when they do well or do poorly. Um, ask Kyle about the non exploits of his gun hauler. And the many times I got to say, I told you so. And, uh, and there you go. You'll, you'll see that there's a whole bunch of stories attached there. That, that um, but that gun hauler conversion, as I recall, he had like the the huge like stacks of uh, uh of mountains or whatever. Like he worked really hard on that one too. <laughs> he did, yeah. It's it's a it's a good. It looks great. It just can't hit for shit, which is the problem. Uh, the one thing it has ever killed was my general, which he will not let me forget. That's, see, do you find yourself because you didn't go like super narrative heavy? The narrative was was kind of on the table and you know what was the mission what were we doing here you didn't have some big arcing plot line you get out there and like script it out like uh uh nuno and and them doing their uh uh man why, why am i blanking on the event name right now i even have the the thing animosity animosity right? yeah yeah you didn't right. quite do like an animosity style thing you really kept it to the uh uh kept it to the uh, kept it to the table um but we you, go ahead we did have a little bit of narrative, and partly the reason we didn't have more is because I was lazy and didn't have the time. So I created an initial narrative for why our why our armies were actually engaged with one another. And then each game, whoever wasn't playing had to come up with narrative obje secondary objectives for the two players who were playing. That's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, as a, a Zinch army, I often had stuff like, I had to cast spells near certain terrain to corrupt it or take control of it. But there did wind up being uh, some fun narrative moments from that. Like I had to kidnap one of Kyle's heroes once. And then in the next game, not intentionally, I mean, I was successful. I successfully kidnapped his, his uh, uh, sorceress, I think. And then, uh, or dwarf sorceress, as he likes to call her. Um, <laughs> And then the next game, when I was playing Christian, he was, like, giving me tips and advice from things he was seeing. And I don't think he meant it to, but it was like, I kidnapped his sorcerer. So it was like, all right, you watch. You give me advice. You tell me what you see. And they were like, all right, fine. Don't kill me. <laughs> so it was kind of like I had actually hijacked his character and was forcing them to give me tips. That's funny. Um, until at the very end, he, he slightly betrayed me by being like, well, I'm not going to call out that you had those destiny dice and you could have made that charge. <laughs> it's like, you... You son of a bitch! I kidnapped you. I thought we had a good thing going here. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, um, so you found like the the narrative sort of like matured like uh, organically, and like you said, you ended up with like pet units and units you kind of like hated. And I mean, that's that's something that you get. I think sometimes in a tournament setting, even if you're not, <laughs> this is I, I've had done shows where I talk about like reading narrative into any format of the game, where like you sure, start, you know, like this is. You know, this is ghoul bag. Uh, this is ghoul bag. Uh, general Slayer. This this model right here. All it ever does in any tournament is try to kill your general. And you know, I'm infusing my own narrative into it. You were actually mm -hmm. kind of like playing through that in real time, where like maybe a unit was like just. Do, do any units like really stand out for you? Obviously, you mentioned the uh, the Zango early on, but like maybe from your opponents, where you like you just it had this like organic narrative where you're like, okay, I gotta watch out for that or. Uh, anything like that? 
Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we decided uh, that the the Cathalar in the Lumineth army was the scariest thing in in all of Shaman because you could go up and you could kill that unit down to a single person and she would make you feel so bad about it, your entire army would run away. And you'd just be like, well, good. Glad I invested that very expensive unit to try to take out your spears. Excellent. That, that felt really good. Or Kyle's gun hauler, which seems to have no aim whatsoever it cannot hit with its cannon except against my general who has plus four to her save and so she is the perhaps the most defensive unit on the field and she's the one who took a cannonball to the face and got knocked off her disc of scene. Well, what it was is they were they were shooting at the zangors and missed <laughs> <laughs> or or i have one kyrick acolyte who successfully deflected a cannon shot with his shield <laughs> just like pink thunk. Yeah. That's funny. Giant giant boat, massive gun, beaten by one half clad guy with a shield. Amazing. Amazing. Like, um, pack it in, pack it in, boys. We're done. We're done. We're there's no way we're getting hired again after this. <laughs> so um so you know, one just to kind of like reset this a little bit. Path to glory, you think it does take some modification out of the box to really, really peak and be enjoyable what would you think of it as a good teaching tool to get people into age of sigmar maybe but i think i don't think it does a great job of teaching you what say a 2000 point game looks like okay. because you don't have your full allegiance abilities you you get weird abilities added onto units that they wouldn't normally get um so i think it's I don't know if it would make for a great teaching tool. I think you'd have better luck there just playing, you know, a 1,000 point game or or playing a 2,000 point game and saying, hey, we're just going to focus on certain units or, or on one particular phase or something like that. Yeah. Um, probably better for someone where they've got their legs in the game al already and, um, you know, they're starting to build up their army and they just want to, you know, do something for fun or something like that. Okay. Takeover Mars mentions that they play Path of Glory wrong because they have full allegiance abilities. It depends on the book. Some books don't give you your full abilities, and others do because they were all written at different times for different phases of AOS. So the rules vary from book to book wildly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is where you so, you kind of talked about like how Christian Ware's better better Path of Glory system TM uh, really helped you out. Yeah, we, we basically compared notes from each of the books we were considering. And, like, uh, if one book said you get your sub-factions and the other two didn't, then we would say, okay, well, nobody will get sub-factions just to keep it even. Um, so we, we tried to compare the books themselves, too, and, and just see if there's anything that was really wildly out of place. See, I mean, this really seems like the system that you gotta you got to put you gotta put the work in to, to get the mm -hmm. most out of this. Um, I think so, yeah. And... And who knows, maybe Christian will compile his notes and put them out there and, and make a list of books of like, here's the change we made to this book. But um, but I think it's worth having the discussion if you're going to do the Path to Glory. Just roll a test army for each of the players. Take a look at how the books differ in their Path to Glory rules. See what it looks like in terms of power. And then just adjust stuff on the fly. Hmm. Okay. Um, did you did you have any? What were some uh, just the benefiting from your your wisdom and having gone through it? What were some of the stuff that you found that you did have to adjust on the fly that you know maybe could save us save the the rest of us slobs some time if we're trying to play a Path to Glory campaign? Sure, I think decide early on before you even start if you are going fully random or if you are going to allow players to make choices and and you have to I think you have to pick one or the other. Okay. If you let people pick, then there are some great combos you can set up, like the Zangor with Soulburn with getting plus three attacks that now are now all mortal wounds, and the Fate Master letting them re-roll all their hits to go fishing for mortal wounds. That's obviously an incredibly strong combo. But if I'm rolling for that ability, well, I might have gotten a totally different ability, and then that's it. Those that unit cannot take another ability now. Right. So I think either decide all random or allowing selections. Keeping in mind, if you let players pick, you're going to get stronger unit connections. Uh, if you let players do things randomly, you're going to get wackier combos. <laughs> I I so. like the I like the wackiness uh, personally. I think that that some of that that's that's the 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 skink suddenly having you know three strength in Blood Bowl. Just like what. What is this? Yeah, <laughs> you know, like when this, you run into this, <laughs> yeah, this unit of skinks now has two wounds. Why? Why do they have that? <laughs> um, 
the one other thing that I would say that we did a little bit differently, since we were viewing the units as unit options, and we made it pretty clear to one another that if we had no interest in buying, building, or painting a, a certain type of unit, just take it out of the table. Um, so, for instance, when I was I was doing my Daughters of Cain table, you know, once I rolled Life Takers once, I was not really all that interested in building or painting any more Life Takers after that. Mm -hmm. So I took them out of the table before my I made my next roll. Now I courtesy of Nuffle, I still didn't get any uh, Witch Elves or, or Blood Sisters or anything like that. You know, saw fit to just give me ranged units instead. <laughs> but that was another way to take some of this thing out of it. You know, if you're if you're doing Nurgle and you don't feel like building or painting more than one unit of Plague Drones, don't leave Plague Drones in your list. Just let players eliminate them and narrow it down. Okay, I see. So, so I mean, you're not beholden to going out and buying entirely new boxes of stuff and, you know, so you just you just cross it out. You're just like, yeah. Right. The whole purpose of why we did this was to take stuff that we knew that we had and then build it and get paint on it. So that way we were making good on things we had previously purchased. So that was part of how we used the Path to Glory as well. Um, but if you're starting whole new armies, then just be honest with yourself about what you're actually interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are building OBR and you have no interest in getting the whatever the name of the guy with the scythe is, who's just terrible right now, it's the Soul Reaper. Like, then don't put a Soul Reaper on your table. Don't Dis force yourself to spend the hard, money on it. Hard disagree. It's one of the coolest models in the entire range. You the should, model, the you model should, is very cool. You should own cool. it because it's super sweet, and it's going to become your Anvil of Hotheosis model. The, and which is what we are doing for Path to Glory Round 2, is we are allowing each of us to take an Anvil of Apotheosis hero as well. So that will be interesting, too. So, That's uh, Go ahead. My only melee, good melee unit going in. <laughs> it's going to be that here. Although life takers are not bad, they're just fragile. Yeah. Well, they're they're life takers are pretty good now, and they're just um, they are glass cannons though. Like they're and I, oh for sure. Just uh, there's some scary stuff going on with the some of the newer DOK uh, builds actually. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. And and in fact, we will look at a very potentially scary build not that much later on in the show. Uh, using Anvil sounds awesome fun. Yeah, I think if I got back into the TO gig, um, if I ran another ran another term tournament, it would be probably 2,000, and you get an Anvil of Apotheosis uh, character of a similar level. And then literally mm -hmm. just go in and be like, yeah, you can't have this, you know, because there's a couple things that people think are problematic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah these just aren't on the list for Anv Anvil of Apotheosis characters. Like, you just can't do that. And then... It's sure. Kind of like the com the the uh, command ability stacking, some of that stuff that people are afraid of. I'm like, fine, it's off the list. You can make Anvil of Apotheosis without this thing, um, but it would be a smaller scale tournament, and I wouldn't, you know, like it's easier to enforce it when you got like 20 people or 20 to 30 people versus like 200. Uh, sure. Oh yeah, doing that for a 200 person event just adds a layer. You would you would want to have a volunteer whose whole job is just managing those heroes if you were exactly. going to do that. Exactly. Making yeah. sure that that none of those abilities that you outlawed aren't making it into the thing and making sure that people, uh, the thing that's on their list is, you know, legally built and what it's supposed to be. And uh, yeah, so that, that, that's the challenge of Anvil of Apotheosis making, uh, you know, mass tournament uh, appeal. That said, I, yeah. I, I love it. I condone it. I think in your mm -hmm. basement games or your, your garden hammer, I think it should be 100% used. Um, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think it's it's a really neat system, but yeah, for larger tournaments, I think it just becomes too unwieldy to try to manage. Right. Until we get something where where you have sort of like a transitive property where you're like, I trust War Scroll Builder. Therefore, when I receive a War Scroll, Scroll Builder sheet, I look at it and I go, I know the points that it says up here and is you know match mm -hmm. what the book actually allows you to purchase because it's updated. It's so on and so forth. Like. Once you sure. get something, uh, something like that, where you're like, I know that that this Anvil of Apotheosis character generation program is legit, and therefore, when I get a print off and I see their little, you know, hashtag or their their URL, I go, okay, I know that this is valid, and therefore, you know, now you only have to check for the stuff that you say, no, you don't get to build or no, you don't get to bring. So. Right, exactly. We don't have a tool like that right now, or or if there is one, I don't know of it personally. So until we have something like that that has that sort of good faith built in there you know it's just continues to be too unwieldy right right um using anvil sounds awesome fun yes it does sound awesome and fun so your your pants pants to glory uh season two 
um, any idea when you're going to like kick off? Well, first off, when you're going to finish off this one and when you're going to kick off season two, you're going to give yourself some downtime between you're going to. There, I believe there is, there's one week in between them because our, our armies were pretty much set for the finale. So we didn't have to really, we had painted up stuff with the plan of trying to go straight into finale game two, but the first game just took long enough that we decided to push it off to another day. Mm -hmm. So not this weekend, but the following weekend, I believe we are doing uh, pants to glory, the finale, the real finale, the the extra finale. <laughs> and then in two weeks we are doing um so the 20th, we're doing the finale, and then the 6th, we are doing the first round of Pants to Glory 2. Like, well, Pants I, Harder or something like that? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Subtitle, <laughs> subtitle to be determined. Yeah. We have to finish the first one, then we'll get the, the subtitle going. Yeah, look at this. Pants, and then 2 is, like, the 2 in the middle, Glory. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Frank. <laughs> well done, Frank. We're borrowing that. Perfect. Um, and so... Next round is going to be My Daughters of Cain versus Kyle's Ossiarch Bone Reapers versus Christian's. Of course, I'm going to blank on what Christian is running right Seraphon. now. Seraphon. Is it Seraphon? Tell me. He's no, right. it's no. not Seraphon. Christian is running, I, I believe it's Nurgle. Ooh, okay. But I forget what he settled on because he had kind of bounced around between Slaves to Darkness, Nurgle, or he's building Nurglorks. So I think there was even a consideration for orcs, but I believe he settled on Nurgle. Okay. Okay. That's so cool. that's cool. Are you going to amp up the uh, the narrative for this one? Are you going to like cut promos and like trash talk each other? Like, um... <laughs> it's not already going on. You just don't publish that. <laughs> like you just not... you're at work and then like you just get a video from Kyle. And he's just pointing at the camera like you're going down. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but we'll see how it goes because I think. I think there there might be some feelings left after season one, so um, I, I don't know I don't know how these first games are going to go. If I pull out the victory in the end and was in the lead the whole time, I uh, might have a bit of a target on my back going into season two. <laughs> That's we're, we're we're kinder and fluffier now. We're just the instead of the people who get to legally cheat at the game. <laughs> well, let's. Yeah, that's the thing about Zeech. It's just legal cheating, right? Um, it it is. I mean, it's Zeech gives the, the Games Workshop told me I could have nine dice and they could be whatever I want. So <laughs> within reason, it's not my fault that I have three different abilities to re-roll them or add new dice to the pool. That's just what the table gave me. <laughs> I I hope I I know uh, I don't choose favorites of the Pants Mafia, but I'm hoping you're winning just for the arc. Just for the, <laughs> just for the salt. I, I think this is the maximum amount of salt uh, results if you win, because they had that opportunity, that false hope, right? That mm -hmm. the wishful thinking of uh, <laughs> of like almost being able to bring it back and almost went like we reset the bracket, we and then you were just like you fools. I was just style <laughs> like I just wanted to style on you even harder for longer. <laughs> It was it was no fun beating you when you weren't at my level. Now I get to beat you as equals. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like freaking just full on bad guy, anime bad guy, anime villain, right? Like <laughs> um, Yeah, well uh I would love to say that was what my plan was, but the battle plan that we played last time was way better for my army. And the battle plan we're playing now is not good for me at all. So my odds have gone down somewhat. Are you are are you randomizing the battle plans? Like, how are you doing the battle? Like, are they out of the path to glory section? How are you doing battle plans? Actually, that's a great uh, thing. To bring so, up. for our one on one games, we use battle plans just straight out of the general's handbook. For the finale, we're using triumph and treachery battle plans. Okay. So the first one we did was one where there were six objectives in like a column, literally across the across the battlefield, and I think it it just shifted which of the six was active that turn. Mm -hmm. And so for me, playing as each Arcanite's build, you know, I have Zangor on foot, I have Zangor enlightened, my units can move very quickly to capture objectives. This next plan we're playing, there is one objective in the center, and that's it for the whole game. Oof. It's going to and... be uh, Boondock Saints, there was a firefight, like it's just yeah. <laughs> mayhem. <laughs> And the it is whoever's model is closest to the center of the objective gets points for the objective at the end of the turn. Hmm. 
Um, but the tricky thing with pa with uh, not with Path to Glory, but with Triumph and Treachery, is they also have the rule that you get objective points if you do five wounds of damage or more per phase. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that has created this new thing of like, yeah, I could go and send out a unit of Zangor to go sit on that objective to claim it for D three points, but that whole unit is twenty wounds. That's four points if they get killed. Mm -hmm. And so is that trade worth it to actually go and put them on that objective? So what I'm hoping is that Kyle and Christian don't watch this video too closely <laughs> or don't look at to this point where they realize that I'm saying the objective is actually bait and isn't actually worth anything. And it's secretly killing off different units in the army that's going to get you the win. Yeah, yeah, there so you go. I'm, I'm hoping Kyle sets up in the middle. I'm like, Christian, come on. Yeah, we got to kill these dwarves. And then a cheeky unit of Enlightened swoops out there and kills something off of his. And I'm like, it's more points than the objective was worth. <laughs> Had to do it. Uh, you made it past the uh, about the 30-minute mark. So it's usually a safe bet, uh, 30 minutes, uh, that the, uh, the casuals don't watch Rantcast anymore. Uh, one hour, even the uh, even the hardcore chat gang, like an official chat gang members, tend to not Oof. make it like a full hour in one sitting. So like they usually have to come back to the the second hour and the third hour. So I think you I think it's pretty safe. It depends on how hardcore uh, they are. <laughs> the, the issue I'm going to run into is that Kyle is one of your mods and possibly a bit of a snitch. So <laughs> we're going to see what happens. <laughs> I don't think he's watching right now. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I wish you luck with the 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 pants to glory. And just real quick, if people want to watch it, where do they go? Just so so we know before we kind of transition here. So we are on YouTube. Our channel is Pants Mafia AOS, and so you can go on there. We have videos from Pants to Glory, but we also have videos that we've put up of just regular battle reports from Two K Games. I have a few with Christian playing uh, Zinch versus his Lumineth, um, or against his Seraphon, which, Jesus, Coles Seraphon are are the anti Zinch build. They are that yeah. was those are some rough games in there. But Christian also has some games that he played against Tanya and Tim. So we've got some games on there against other people who are sort of pants mafia adjacent members. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and we also have videos from the small. Um, uh, how are we describing it? A uh, basement hammer, I think was how we were calling it. A, a small six person event that we did um, with uh, Brendan and Dan and Dave from Milwaukee. So uh, me and Kyle and Christian played them and they wound up taking the day. And we have the videos from that as well, which includes my Darkling Coven's Anvil Guard army killing two uh, stone horns in a single turn. Oh, ooh, spicy. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So go watch that. I still lost, but it's worth a watch. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm going to go and refill my water and coffee, and you have a planned bit of your own. I do. Uh, I do. Um, yes. For when I do this, we look at this is this is the veteran. See, you may not be veteran in ability for Age of Sigmar, <laughs> but you are a veteran rant cast guest for ability. Um, knowing That's... that you got to have the prepared topics for when I walk away from the camera, like a professional. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, so you carry on with whatever you need to do. Everyone, you might remember the last time I was here that I threw shade at other elf players. So guess what? In in honor of what's happening with GameStop, today I bring you Elf Stonks. That's, what, that's right. Welcome to Elf Stonks. Uh, now, with the upcoming this Saturday, uh, Daughters of Cain are getting a new battle tome. So obviously their, their stock is high on the rise. Um, which, as anyone who's run into someone bloodthirsty and ready to rip your heart out, you probably want to be on their good side. So, yes, high on the stocks for Daughters of Cain. Normally, this is where I'd throw shade at high elf players, but uh, as it turns out, they've got Broken Realm's Teclas coming down the pipe sometimes. So, you know, I guess it's fair to say their stock is on the rise, too. So then that would leave me throwing shade at wood elf players instead, but... They just revealed today one of the new heroes for Curse City is a Kurnothi sort of successor to the old Wood Elf Waystalker, and the model looks beautiful. So I guess you folks get one model. Congrats. Well done. Um, of course, with Broken Realms Marathi, all of the Dark Elf range is on the rise, so obviously they're doing very well. And our perpetual winner is Umberneth, who don't actually have a single model or barely any mentions in the lore. So yeah, well done. They're doing better than, than everybody else. So this was your update on Elf Stonks. 
Um, if any of your elves were not mentioned, I forgot about them or didn't care. Uh, Ida and Thievekin were in Broken Realm Serenathi, so there you go. They're doing well. They, their, their stocks are rising, much like the tides. There you go. There's your terrible pun for the day as well. Um, those of you who are fans of things like Sword Masters, uh, you're probably going to get more of them soon. It seems like they were in one of the Lumineth trailers, so good for you if you like them. Black art are better. Sorry, it's just the way it is. And uh, any other elves that I need to call out here? Um, no, no, I think I've hit the highlights. This has been your Elf Stonks moment. And uh, let's all remember that Dark Elf players are still the best. We won. We won in the old world. Uh, that being said, I am looking forward to any new Dark Elf stuff that comes along the way. It'll be nice to get some new Daughters of Cain. Uh, the Endless spells look great. They look phenomenal. We've even seen some highlights of the rules. So, yeah, continue crying your tears. The Daughters of Cain are going to continue being one of the best defensive armies in the game, it looks like. So, yes, cry cry your tears while being having your hearts ripped out. Uh, don't don't question why this section is coming up when there's a mental health professional on here. That's totally fine. This doesn't make there are no contradictions here whatsoever, ladies and gentlemen. Other than that, I think that's pretty good. I'll be interested to see if we get any other elf models in Cursed City. I imagine they might just limit us to the one, but the so far the models we're seeing there are beautiful and I think they're they're have sort of a Bloodborne or Darkest Dungeon vibe to them. So it is really interesting to see Warhammer go in that direction. I think it's it's quite a nice aesthetic for them to pull from. But who knows? Maybe we'll get uh maybe we'll get some interesting other elves in there. With Soren, I agree. Elves are great, dwarves are terrible. Then again, I am very far to the elf side on the elf to dwarf continuum. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Or don't, because dwarves also suck but we get the grains of salt from them because they're miners. So who knows? Maybe they'll hold them hostage. Yeah, I think that's uh, that was my prepared segment. I hope you all are doing well after I've just spent this time insulting about half of the fan base. But yes, I hope you're all doing well. Staying warm in the Midwest. It's cold and frigid here, and we're all still dealing with COVID. So, you know, I, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're all keeping safe, keeping healthy. Vaccines are rolling out, so hopefully that's something we can all look forward to gradually. I will be getting the second round of the vaccine soon, and uh, I will keep you all posted on how well that goes. I'm expecting that I'll be like, oh, it's fine. I'll see all my clients that day. And then halfway through, I'll be crawling on my floor with shivers and chills and ready to you know, throw up in my trash can being like, why? Why would I do this to myself? Uh, Mef has asked, even though he's not here, he's always good at staying in touch with the chat, what are some things you hope for for Umbraneth? Uh, well, the obvious one is a great Malarian model. If we don't have a really cool Malarian model, I will be very disappointed. Uh, but from just the, the brief art we've seen, I think there's going to be some really cool stuff that they can do there. The second thing that I would hope for is actually, we had a lore snippet, I think in the first Daughters of Cain book, that talked about what happened with each of the different elf gods as they tried made their initial attempts to utilize the souls they were pulling from Slanesh. And it was mentioned that Malarian made, in particular, created some uh, giant grotesqueries that he has hidden away so that people wouldn't see them. So I'm, I think it would be really interesting if in Umbradeth we actually got some giant models of some kind in an elf range that reflected those those sort of initial failures that have now been shanghaied into Umberneth forces. I had mentioned a while back that, you know, think pulling from either the Bloodborne or the Dark Souls aesthetic of the sort of like really gaunt giants or really lanky giants that with like veils and things like that, like the uh, Boreal Dancer from Dark Souls 3 or even thinking of the Cleric Beast is another good example from Bloodborne. I think it would be really interesting if we had these you know, this sort of dark imitation of some of the Lumineth in some, like, heavily armored elf models, but backed up by these sort of grotesque giants that stemmed from the the failed fusion or, or creation from these elf souls. Especially since in the lore, Malarian himself now is a fusion of elf and dragon. I think it would be interesting if we saw some, like, twisted shapes of that, not just, like, this is a dragon with big ears or something like that. I don't think anyone's going to be excited if that turns out to be what we get. Takeover Mars says, I'm one of the favorite guests because of Bloodborne and Dark Souls talk. And yes, you got to know your niche. 
So there you go. That's how that's how I win the fans. Yeah. Yeah, the 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 the, the you stand at the center of the Venn diagram of uh of everything that I've been doing the last month which is <laughs> 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 trying to keep my mental health like in check uh playing the hell out of bloodborne and obviously age of sigmar um yeah um no uh sorry soren that wasn't toilet meth not not this time it was refill my water and <laughs> coffee um the only time i really use the keurig is i, I don't like them I, I don't think they're last time i was looking into their environmental impact the k-cups are horrible so yeah yeah they're they're pretty bad i'm i was fine with them when i was like i don't care if it's shitty coffee because i think all coffee is bad so that's fine with me but i'd prefer not to destroy the environment in the process of having my shitty coffee right you see you mentioned like the whole uh connoisseur coffee thing um i'm like a non like <laughs> yes exactly there we go that's the term for it it's like i love coffee but like but like I, it doesn't need to be high end. I actually think that the worse the coffee, the better it is because the coffee, you see, it's got to resonate. When you see, I'm an American blue collar worker. <laughs> um, I drink coffee because it it helps me have energy and be awake, but also it resonates with my soul. You see, the crappier the <laughs> coffee, the more it just like it gets me. Like it's this beverage that understands me. It's bitter. <laughs> Sometimes it tastes like gasoline. You know, like it's <laughs> like it's never the optimal temperature. There's like that that Overton <laughs> yeah, window. Right. There's just this like this small Overton window of when it's like the most enjoyable <laughs> of to drink, which is right above room temperature, because it's either too hot, too cold, or room temp. It's there's that little window where it's like optimal. It's just when you're drinking coffee, it is it is the the act of drinking coffee is the metaphor for life. That's why it's great. You know, this uh. is. This is the closest not- to being a vampire I will ever actually be because I'm <laughs> drinking the life of an American when I drink coffee. And I think a, a good thing for all of us, don't pursue perfection. You'll, you'll just be disappointed. I know many of you are excited for the new Slanesh release coming out, but there's a reason he's a chaos god. Perfection, generally speaking, is bad. Well, I mean, that's – that's uh, I'm actually uh, – uh, that's the thing I like the most about Slanesh as a Slanesh god. Um Oh, I, I want to talk about this real quick, and then I want to kind of reset something you said while I was I was making coffee. Um, the uh, like Slanesh is this like sort of hum- human thing, this this mm. this sort of story for humanity. Like per- pursuit of per- perfection without balance is horrible. Like you mm-hmm. you you sacrifice Absolutely. like things you sacrifice in your life. Like it, for instance, if I, if I pursued being the perfect writer, the the best writer. I I'd have to give up time with my family. I'd have to give up the show. Like all the mm-hmm. things if I don't balance that pursuit of perfecting my 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 craft as a writer with again some mindfulness, it, it would turn me into you know this is that's the path to Hemingway or or you know like mm-hmm. that's that's where you end up in or, some of these these unhealthy places. Or early who's the um who's the the really popular horror writer who's sort of like does a modern Stephen take King? on a lot of love. Stephen King, that's it. Like early Stephen King, where he's well, he was would a- go back later and and say like, I yeah, I don't remember writing this book. The book turned out really well, but I was drinking my ass off and I was on cocaine the whole time. To the point that he even wrote a whole book about his experience with trying to get away from that. Yeah, well, The Shining is is very uh, autobiographical, which is why it has such a dour ending. The, the he he doesn't like the Kubrick film because it almost portrays Jack in a sympathetic light. And he was a lot harsher on, on the mm-hmm. character in, in the novel and getting that across the, 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 the tragedy of, of his situation. Right. And, and what Soren calls out here that Slanesh loves elves. And I think they go together so well because we have this idea here of, the elves have so long in their lives that they actually have the ability to potentially try to achieve perfection. And so that often leads them down that maddening path of, of feeling like I have unlimited time to get there, but also they have so many peers to compare themselves to. Mm-hmm. Like think about how hard it is when we compare ourselves to people who are even just a few years older than us. Now imagine that you have your great, 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 great grand uncle who is like your 500 year senior and you're in the same field. 
Mm-hmm. And people are like, mm, not measuring up to great, 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 grand uncle. It's like, how am I supposed to? He's 500 years older than me. It's that's, like, oh, yeah, you'll, you'll get there another 499 years. Well, see, that's, I mean, that's, but they will be another 500 years older still, right? Like, right. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the kind of cool thing about elves I hadn't considered until exactly this moment. Um, their plight with Slanesh, um, humans have a very condensed uh, you know, life by many measures in the mortal realms, right? Like, with the exception, mm-hmm. you know, obviously, like, Stormcast to get, get around this, but their, their crux is inborn in the, the reforging and losing their self. Um, oh. the, but yeah, like, humans by, by association, like, you, it feels like whilst, whilst elves are like, they're like the good shit, like, they're, they're the, they're, they're the, they're the Wagyu beefsteak, um, humans are cheeseburgers, right? Like, cause they, right. <laughs> because they, because their their perfection, that pressure to pursue it and excellence, they they fall so much faster, right? Mm. Um, than like an elf, whereas like the elf's got to like dry age over time. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, you, and and it's. It is really uh, just this interesting juxtaposition of how, you know, humans are the candle that burns too bright, and so that attracts them to Slanesh, whereas elves are, you know, overly emotional perfectionists on a good day. And so Slanesh is like, well, sign me up. They sound perfect. We are perfectly aligned right here. Right. You are my perfect victims. Can I can I ask then, because so um, I find that uh, you've got like the – the Slanesh player who despises elves, and you've got the elf player who kind of despises Slanesh. How how do you feel about Slanesh, just just in general? Like, I I find so I don't like the Slanesh elves trope because I fall more on the elf side than on the Slanesh side, and I think it's it's not necessarily that interesting anymore to do the like, oh we're we're gonna do uh we're gonna do a Slanesh version of something. We should do elves. But I do have to acknowledge the fact that they are very close. So, like, I don't actually want to see any models of that, but I can't help but grudgingly acknowledge that, yeah, it would make sense to have those. Yeah, that's fair. Um, also, I think because a lot of people are really used to and wedded to the old Marathi lore, where she continued to be a, uh, a Slanesh worshiper long into uh like into the modern times and when gw went back and retcon that later on saying you know no actually she didn't she was captive by slanesh but she didn't worship them she worshiped the out of desire and uh, authority i think mm-hmm. um and which i think actually made it a much more interesting thing of marathi being this traumatized person who was trying to navigate her best through the different situations she was in and finding different analogs and ways to to navigate that trauma while still recognizing that her abuser was terrible and you know and wanting to oppose them in every way, mm-hmm. but perhaps also perpetuating the cycle of abuse. Well, it's, it's interesting now because like with with Marathi really kind of achieving like full agency of her of her grand designs and mm-hmm. um, I haven't read the the full. Broken Realms Marathi, just the, sort of the Cliff's Notes and listening to uh, uh, Two Plus Tough and stuff like that. These are the standard thing people do, people do when they, mm-hmm. they don't read the full book. Um, like, my understanding is, like, she's just kind of, like, they, she's, she's, she's arrived. Like, she needs to kind of go mm-hmm. back to basics a little bit, because her premise for so long has been achieving godhood. Now that she has it, like, mm-hmm. I think that that's a, that makes an interesting uh, character thing uh, to explore now going forward. But also... She fervently hates Slanesh, like mm-hmm. more than yeah. ever in in the current iteration of of the Mortal Realms. And yet, the dichotomy of it is is she she's probably the one that in the end really broke the bonds for Slanesh. And the, the re- all the stuff we're going to see for Broken mm-hmm. Realms, which is I think you know we, we've got the you know the the newborn or whatever, and like there's mm-hmm. s- stuff big implications for Slanesh. Uh, but that's that was the stroke that did it, right? Like that. Um, Marathi going in and 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 basically attaining godhood. Yeah, and I think we we see in Age of Sigmar the playing out of these cycles of tragedy in the elf storyline that I think is is why we often have such a Greek and Roman aesthetic to them is they really are channeling some of those themes of these incredibly powerful but also incredibly tragic figures right like marathi has been an extremely powerful person from day one but her origin story is of being a victim and being abused Mm -hmm. and now that's a trope in and of itself of gw like 
throwing a victimized woman in there. Yeah, Alarial but... comes to mind actually, and as a very recent story where they that's kind of like the angle they took, and I, I think Alarial could use a bit of a retcon because this we need to get away from this. But go on. Yeah, I, I I think there are ways that you can take the mother goddess trope that Alarial has kind of been forced into. But I mean, you also have to be sympathetic for Alarial. Her mother-in-law is Marathi, and her husband is Malekith. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, back in the day, she had a relationship with Tyrion. All of her exes and ex-family are still in the picture. She doesn't even get a reprieve in the oh. mortal realm. After the whole world gets blown up, she's like Deborah from Everybody Loves Raymond if they all ascended to godhood, but she had divorced <laughs> Ray. So, like, it's it's this really tricky position that she's in. And so I, I actually found it kind of interesting in, in Broken Realms, there is a bit where Marathi approaches her and basically says, look, you know, we have not always had the best history, but we're both mothers, and so we both can appreciate the fact that we don't want our kids to suffer so if you won't do what I'm asking you to do for Sigmar, you won't do it for the cause or anything like that, will you do it for the fact that you're pissed off that people are hurting your kids? Right. And which, that's what she has to open the, the life gate or whatever, right? Like, Yeah, exactly. And that convinces her. And she's like, yeah, great. Also, I'm going to flood the entire area and drown everyone there. So, you know, if you're in the way, I don't care. Here you go. Here's your flood. That was a that was a such a super metal moment because she essentially like opens the gate, which is is a waterfall, and just like <laughs> you were you asked for the gate to be open. You never said it had to be easy to travel, right? Well, <laughs> you you touched on something while I was I was making coffee about uh you know the Umbraneth and and stuff like that. Some implications. I, I'm hoping Broken Realms is sort of like okay, Slanesh is back, but Umbraneth show up. Like I'm, mm. I think it's probably more logical that Teclas does. Um, that well, Tyrion, Tyrion shows sorry, up Tyrion mean? does. Yeah. yeah, but um, I'm I'm hoping we get Umbraneth at the tail end, or at least like a big ass like, you know, coming twenty and like an image of Malakath. That's what I'm hoping for, or Malarian. Sorry, um, that's my hope because especially like there's this part where um, we're like uh. Uh, Marathi like essentially pays the tithe and bribes Catacros, <laughs> right? And I'm like, and, she, right, and, yeah. and he he gets all the like the cool ass shadow bones, and I'm like, what are the shadow bones? What are the shadow bones? <laughs> like, I want to see that story where where like, you know, Teclas is marching on Asia or whatever when you know Te Broken Realms mm -hmm. Teclas. I want to see that moment where like where, like, we get to see what the Shadow Bones are for, and that this sort of segues into Umbraneth, like, showing up. And right. either hel teaming up with Teclas and being like, yo, Abomination, you just used the sweet Shadow Bones, like, and being <laughs> mad. Or it's like, they're kind of like, ho they have that, like, uh, alliance of convenience for a moment because there's bigger fish to fry, and... Uh, we all know Malarian uh, doesn't mind thumbing his nose at Tyrion and Teclas from time to time. So, <laughs> oh, I I know the the end times books get a lot of flack, but one of the things that I actually really enjoyed was just watching all of the times that Malekith just throws jabs at Teclas now that he's actually around all the time because Teclas is backing him in the end times, uh -huh. and all the times he gets to he gets to like dripping with venom refer to him as nephew or there's even one time where he he successfully goes through the phoenix king ritual and he refuses to leave even while the building's being bombarded even while they're on the verge of getting overrun until teclas bows to him <laughs> so good <laughs> he's, he's like i'm the king now i could be a petulant asshole all i want Oh. We're not moving anywhere until you bow to your lord and master. And Texas is like, are you fucking kidding me? Oh, so good. Now I... of all times? And he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, now, <laughs> now, come on. <laughs> in, a, in a much more effective and, and prose-flowing way, of course. Uh, see, I love I, I love the bad guys in Age of Sigmar too much. And they're just, uh, uh, with the exception of a couple, like Manfred, mm -hmm. whatever, to... Um, but like, well, he just needs he needs an interesting plot line. I think if when he actually gets a writer who's like, let me write you a story, then he might he's like a, he can interestingly be a tragic figure too. Now, the I mean the 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 sort of like petulant child arc that he has is not mm. a good one. Like I, it's it's not a good one. Like we get it. You're you're he, he reminds me an awful lot of uh of Malfoy, 
um, mm. uh, Babby Malfoy, not Lucius. I, I'm, Draco Malfoy. He reminds me an mm-hmm. awful lot of like of Draco Malfoy, where you're always kind of hoping that he just has this like epic moment, and he's just he's just a MacGuffin the whole time. <laughs> like it's just like he's early on, like okay, like high school drama, drama, right? Schoolyard mm. drama, and then it's just like utterly, just never, just this simpering kid. The whole time, <laughs> and it, like it, they need to evolve, Manfred story. I don't mind the duplicitous looking to get the upper hand. Like I even think th- the the Nagash keeping him around because he knows Manfred wants to betray him, and he has that like Hades punishment thing. And right, the, the best punishment for Manfred is to always have him chasing, right? Like to always have him right. thinking, thinking he can like he's going to backstab Nagash and succeed in the end, and he's like, and he's just like. Not today. <laughs> like that's so like it's so Nagashian punishment. It's great, but like on the flip side, Manfred just like needs to get out that hamster wheel. Like needs to right do something. Like like I think I think we could wring so much from his from his storyline from his perspective of him serving a master unwillingly, but also dealing with everything that he witnessed in the old world because he's sort of. The last I heard of it was kind of like unrepentant in his view of how he handled things in the end. That, yeah, he may have been the one who doomed the world, but he doesn't see it that way. Yeah, he doesn't care. He's like, yeah. Oh. Yeah, look at, look, look. I mean, he's, he's, uh, uh, Clint, uh, from the Heralds of War, uh, you know, T.O. of CanCon. Manfred's one of his favorites. Uh, he, he often takes the line that, um, Manfred gave us Age of Sigmar, so of course he's cool. <laughs> and I think Manfred would actually think that himself. He's like, look at how much cooler and and look at how much of the script is unwritten in the in the in the mortal realms versus the world that was, mm-hmm. which was like getting kind of crowded and stuffy. And you know, his ambition he's got more room for his ambitions now uh, in mm-hmm. the mortal realms. You know, there's more opportunities for him in the mortal realms. I think there's there can be some compelling stuff there, but it, they need to move away from the little simpering child bit that that he's kind of been sure um there is in some of a lot of the stories nagash keeps him around you know ha 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 punishment stuff but he succeeds the thing the Mm. thing that is often overlooked when we when i'm shitting on manfred (laughs) uh because he's not i mean really his greatest crime is not being vlad if we're going to be honest right yeah like well because vlad it's the Celestin Prime, of course. <laughs> right, Vlad is the is the Celestin Prime. That's right. I will die on that conspiracy theory hill. Yeah, fantastic. Um, <laughs> Vlad von Karstein's the Celestin Prime. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, like like Manfred succeeds though, and that's one of the mm-hmm. one of the big big things is that is that you know if he you know Nagash needs this like weird this big ambush moment or that like he's like I need that castle, mm-hmm. and he'll have Manfred go and take that castle right like and and manfred succeeds so there is that mm-hmm. to his story he doesn't really when he when when he, when the the manfred card gets played uh he succeeds at it you know? yeah i think and and i don't know if this is a great direct analogy because i'm less well versed in the 40k lore but one of the most like tortured characters in the imperial lore is conrad kurz who is the primarch of the night lords who are the sort of like terror legion there they were born with the whole idea that they use terror tactics mm-hmm. and he while their whole legion turns traitor because they're mostly made up of psychopaths and sadists mm-hmm. like he has a whole character arc about you what do you do when you're the dad of the sadists and the psychopaths and the job that you've been given is you need to be the one who is terrifyingly effective at your job mm-hmm. but you will be hated by everyone forever mm-hmm. and it seems kind of like Manfred could fit into an arc like that of you have now become the one that Nagash sends out to do the dirty jobs for Nagash and you get the results but what does it mean to be that person yeah I mean that that's a compelling arc to I mean that that's a compelling story now that's that's a story I would want to read yeah Uh, especially when the only people you have to compare yourself to are other immortals essentially yeah. And if and if anyone is looking for a very interesting take on this, I would recommend the Gideon the Ninth series, which explores that idea of how do Im- immortal necromancers relate to one another in sort of more modern sensibilities. Mm-hmm. What is this? Gideon the Ninth. It's a book series. Um, it. It's a it's a a setting that's kind of similar in some ways to 40k, in that it is sort of this 
like space faring pseudo gothic medieval uh uh M, like sci-fi empire but it's all run by necromancers so it is an entirely necromantic society bow, bow. Um, <laughs> it is they're very well written the they are very funny the first book is very funny the second book has really interesting takes on psychosis mm-hmm. and um and also all of the main character perspectives are female and it was written by a woman so i thought that was really refreshing Fantastic. too to get to get that kind of, of perspective out there no, this is this is jumping the top of my uh, of my book list now. Um, I've got some stuff. Yeah, I I did not put them down when I started reading them. There are two, and then the third one is on the way, uh, sometime. It's been a while since I've had a like a book recommendation where I'm like, oh, I need to read that. Like this is this is one of those. I've been trying to read back through some uh, PKD uh, Philip K. Dick stuff that I mm. read at the time, and like I was too young. Now that I'm older and kind of searching th- researching through like what I believe in reality mm-hmm. in the world around me and myself like now i'm like pkd had a book on this i'm gonna go read that <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah i i hear you i'm doing that in a slightly different way in that i am i am playing persona 5 royal and <laughs> persona 5 was a game that actually got me to reflect on where i was at in an organization i was working for and realize I don't think I can stay here because I don't like how they're treating other people. Mm -hmm. And if I just stay because it's comfortable for me, that, that speaks ill of me. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I had to change and I had to start speaking up for the people who didn't have a voice, even though I was one of the people who was in a more privileged position. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, it never escapes me how significant and important art is in interpreting my life it, mm-hmm. it i'm just one of those people i some people you know i i'm not gonna go in a big soapbox moment here and you know tell other people like this is how this is the way you know you got to look at a painting by edward munch and then you're gonna like reassess your life but it is how i see the world it's how i uh, music does it a lot um mm. like i'll listen to a song uh you know my whole big thing with compassion uh, this uh, that I've been on basically since the uh, BLM protests and 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 George Floyd's uh, murder um, has been about finding compassion for my enemies mm-hmm. and, and my enemies. I mean, wow. I, obviously, I'm not like going to duel somebody on a hill. That's not what I mean. But like the right. people I disagree with, like at the core mm-hmm. of my being, you know, uh, how do you yeah. have compassion for somebody like the people who who beat up me and my brother growing up just mm-hmm. to call out my brother's skin? How do I have compassion for this? trailer park trash that lived across the way from us or across the circle as it would have been known and Hmm. just saw skin and hate it how do i have compassion for somebody like that and um i i think that is a great question and uh to clue you in a little bit on on how we look at that when we use the compassionate perspectives in therapy uh, we talk about the idea of forgiveness but forgiveness is much more for the person doing the forgiving than it is for the person who is being forgiven. Mm -hmm. It's about the letting go of the anger and the pain that we've held on to in order so that we can develop either the relationship with the person we feel has hurt us or our relationships in general. Mm -hmm. And something that has been a really consistent and surprising finding in our literature is the holding on to grudges, holding on to anger. It has no mental health benefit. It's actually negative. It's toxic for your mental health. So Duarden are wrong. <laughs> they are in fact incorrect. They are in fact now maybe you know they are a different species. Maybe the dwarf mind works differently. We we cannot tell. They are an alien intelligence to us. <laughs> right. But, right. But for humans, from what we've seen in the psychological literature, there is no benefit to the holding on of grudges. It actually causes you more pain in the long run. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean that you just open yourself up to being exploited by anyone. We can forgive and then and choose not to forget and still protect ourselves. Right. But forgiveness means accepting what has happened to us, accepting the pain and the anger and saying, I am going to let go of this. Well, I mean, that's 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 the hard. I mean, that's the hardest part. I mean, mm-hmm. like I have such a. Uh, if any, if this is your first episode of watching Rantcast, dear dear viewer, dear listener, uh, dear member of chat gang, uh, you may not know this yet, but I'm pretty outspoken on what I believe. Uh, I hope that I have enough finesse with what I believe to not feel like I'm always trying to impose my beliefs on others, but rather, 
you know, I live my life with a healthy dose of Cartesian doubt. That means, uh, you know, Descartes, uh, everything I mm. know to be true may be wrong, right? Like, I, mm. live, I live believing that, that everything I think and believe could be wrong, right? Mm. I don't believe in objective reality so much as consensus reality. Um, like, it doesn't matter that we, have, we don't have a uniform uh, theory of physics just yet. I know that if I throw this thing over a ledge, gravity is going to take over and it's going to fall. That the consensus belief of, of what happens uh, when I interface with reality. Um, that mm-hmm. being said, I'm very outspoken about my opinion on Nazis and that they're coming, <laughs> that they're coming back now. And, and there's just people out there who are like, yeah, it's okay to have Nazis around. And I'm just like, no, no, it's not okay to have Nazis around. Cool. Like, they need to go away. They, like, you're cool. not welcome. And to it be, should not be an unpopular opinion that Nazis are bad right. and we should not tolerate them. Right. And and so how do I have compassion for somebody that I so fundamentally disagree with? And sure. like like I, I think punching I'm the type of person who thinks punching Nazis is a team sport. Like I <laughs> like you know, we all gotta get on board here because as soon as Nazis show up, we kinda gotta stop doing everything else and be like, Nope, no, there's Nazis. Get you know, all of human history no. has said this is wrong. But then I look at, like, you know, somebody who has – comes from – gets to a perspective of hate. Mm-hmm. And I look at them and, and with – whilst not excusing their hate and not being okay with it, again, mm-hmm. at a fundamental level, you know, this is, this is my – one of my biggest triggers, obviously, is, is racial – uh, and uh, is often racial issues. Um, just mm-hmm. I, I grew up a certain, I grew up in a biracial family. It's I've yeah. been the victim of violence uh, because of this. I have scars on my body. Um, right. Like to to have this visceral reaction to racism and racists and obviously Nazis, but still be like, but you got there some way. Like you didn't mm-hmm. start. Like I look at my my kids are still at that age where they don't even really recognize like they're still if you hand them a box of crayons the the characters uh, that they draw will be rainbow colored right like they they're right. not yes they're not externalizing that that yet where they're just like oh yeah some people are white some people are brown some people are black like they're not doing that they're just, mm-hmm. just rainbow char- they're still at that age and i remember a moment where my mom when i was home getting bullied i just you know just gotten beat it up like this one particular time and I'm like sobbing and trying to figure out why they hate me and, and Rafael just for walking to school. And she tells me, she tells me very plainly, like Andrew, when you look at your brother, you see your brother. And when some people look at him, they just see his skin. And mm. I think I was about seven years old when my mom told me that. Like, yeah. and, and to just remember that moment. So before my kids have had to encounter this, their, their friend right. Ari, their, you know, main friend. She's also from a biracial family. Like, that's my son's best friend. She's over here. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the only people in our bubble right now. It's 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 Ari and her mom. Uh, yeah. Our bubble's pretty small. Um, and my kid, he, Colin, hasn't registered it yet. And mm-hmm. Ari herself is just now. She's about ten years old. She's just now beginning. It, it's becoming apparent to her, and I'm I'm starting to watch her struggle with that. Uh. And again, how do I maintain compassion whilst simply not tolerating hate? Like it just sure. It's a great question, and w- the way that we tend to define compassion is that compassion is the connection, the willingness to connect with and empathize with someone's pain, and the commitment to do something to alleviate that pain. And that all people are deserving of compassion, but compassion might look a lot different for your son's, you know, childhood friend who's just now realizing that the world is not fair. And there are people who are going to be very prejudiced against her for a very arbitrary reason versus the people holding that prejudice. What is compassionate to manage our pain and their pain might look quite a bit different, you know, for someone like uh, I had this this discussion with one of my clients where they said, well, you know, what about a serial killer? How do we be compassionate to them? And, well, we draw boundaries around them. We limit their ability to hurt other people and cause pain in broader society. Now, that's an extreme example, of course, but there is a way to be compassionate to others 
but sometimes it looks a lot different, a lot more rigid, and possibly even a lot, uh, possibly even harsh. But that's the thing that actually reduces the pain. You know, we don't give Nazis a platform because they cause hate and pain, yeah. and it, they use it to hurt other people. Yes, we may be limiting their ability to have a voice, but their voice amplifies pain. So in that way, you know, yeah. that's how we are kind to them. Well, that's called the, the paradox of intolerance, right? Like where yeah. if you tolerate intolerance too much, then the net pain societally done or the net harm to a society actually increases. So there has to be a threshold to what you tolerate. Um, uh, and then you work in those in those middle degrees mm -hmm. of, you know, OK, well, we may not allow you know, parlor to be around because it's becoming a cesspool. But then maybe individually that person, you know, who's not just some random Nazi shithead on the Internet. He's actually your cousin and you see him at family gatherings. Maybe you try to start a dialogue with him. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe it's too painful to do that. That's OK. You can draw that boundary. Mm -hmm. But maybe you're one of those people in the middle who still has some some goodwill with that person who they might actually listen to. Well, that's or. Or maybe you get someone who, like an ex-Nazi, who is able to speak to their to the ideology, to speak to the attraction to it, and say, "There's another way, or there's a different way." There's this there's this fantastic video, um, and it's probably not the the best named series of videos. Um, I think it's called like the alt right playbook or something like that. Is the series of videos, mm -hmm. and one of them is called uh, is is called radicalizing a normie, um, mm -hmm. and and um, and it was. I remember this moment. I, I've, I'm a lifelong nerd. Uh, you know, I can lay out my resume for folks, but I'd start with, uh, you know, I've got a podcast where all I do is talk about nerd shit as my first thing. Um, <laughs> the um, the self honk, like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the, the alt right playbook lays out, you know, radicalizing a normie. And I remember being a lifelong nerd, and for the longest time, I've been drawn to nerd stuff because it was, and I hate the vernacular, I hate the term, but for lack of a better term, uh, a safe space. I could mm -hmm. escape the the bullies. Oh. I could escape my struggles with depression, my, my mom's struggles with bipolar-like disorder. I could go away from mm -hmm. that and I could read a comic book or I could play a game or a video game and for just like one brief moment like hit the pause button and just escape to that but i you know i, I found myself right. gravitating towards towards the media because like okay if i play tabletop games everyone is truly equal in a tabletop game right mm -hmm. like abilities yeah. will distinguish it but like if we play an rpg like man woman you know nb um you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, it doesn't matter, like, ethnicity, religion, all that stuff. When you play a tabletop game, you construct a different character it, it, entirely. It, like, you, you all start with the same set of rules for character creation. Like, you you just, you know, you, you f my read of it mm -hmm. um, was, hey, we're, like, finally equal. This is the one place we get to be equal. And, right. And as I, as these last, this last about half a decade to, to ten years... Um, I've seen these spaces that I thought were very safe becoming safe haven for, quite frankly, trash opinions. Like, mm. you know, like, oh. becoming platforms of hate. And and I'm just like, wait a second, the thing, like, I'm reading X-Men, which is a comic book I always thought was an analog for the civil rights movement, and right. you were and you were reading this and were like, hell yeah, Nazis are cool. I'm like, we were reading the same fucking comic book or or Star Wars, where yeah. like I'm like, hey man, Star Wars is like awesome. I really like the rebels and like how they're like standing up to space Nazis. And you're like, oh, space Nazis are so fucking sweet. Yeah. What the fuck? They're the yeah. bad guys for a reason. Yeah. You know, 40k yeah, like, we see it pretty. Go ahead. That yeah, the the Empire did nothing wrong goes from being a silly meme to being an actual genuine idea that people have. And let's not forget, they're the guys who blow up the planets with billions of people on them. <laughs> Yeah, like there's they, it, are, they literally are dressed like Nazis. You can have a closer analog at this point. Yeah, they're called stormtroopers. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, my my battery on my laptop is about to die. So give me one moment. I'll be right back. Yeah, but yeah. carry on your thought here. Yeah. So so it was interesting to me that these spaces that I had surrounded myself with to be safe to 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 escape the the, the realities were were having this amplifying effect to people who believe something quite frankly counter to, to, to everything I believe. And then I watched this video radicalizing an army 
end. I, you can also see something called the PewDiePie pipeline, um, or I'd call it the alt right pipeline. Uh, you can watch some of this stuff, and it's it finally made sense having watched this video. How, like me, people of a different opinion had come to comics, had come to gaming, to escape their own reality. They just kind of fingered a different problem, and when they said something that like you know dirty libs didn't like in those safe spaces um they would they feel ostracized and even more isolated and so that what ends up happening is they get this feedback loop of of lack of compassion from people in their space they get applauded by a more radical section of it and i think this this pipeline happens by the way in going both directions um they get applauded for their actions from a certain undesirable group and they just gradually fall into it to it where eventually it is, you know, the empire did nothing wrong. Um, you know, they're eventually they become arch warhammer, I guess is what I'm saying. Like they don't start there. It's a gradual process. And I don't think whilst having an intolerance for hate is, you know, that's my line in the sand. I don't think it's been productive to hate the hater, so to speak, because we're not building consensus. There's there's people who aren't too far gone that if we talked to them again, if we if we built a consensus of in and discussed in good faith, we might actually be able to kind of like bring them back from the dark side to keep rolling with the the Star Wars me uh, metaphor. Yeah, it's very true. And so I am. Um... I'm working on getting the the video going here. It just might take me a moment. No, that's Apologies, right. everyone. No, no. Enjoy me being a series of dancing squares. Yeah, we we uh, we do it live here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> troubleshoot in real time. So, refilled coffee in real time. Yeah. So there is a comment in the chat that I wanted to address, and then maybe from there, just in the interest of time, maybe we'll start to shift over to some of these lists. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Some of these army lists we have there. So uh, we have Takeover Mars asking, you know, we were talking about forgiveness earlier and the idea that, you know, when we're trying to forgive, we're trying to let go of anger and pain in order to be able to rebuild or repair a relationship. And uh, Takeover Mars asks, but how do you let go of that anger and pain? It's something that we struggle with, and we can often just try to push that down or suppress it. And that's a great, a great call. It's not necessarily an easy thing that we do. It can take time. It can take repeated effort. It helps when we get a sincere apology from the other person, but we often don't. And if you go fishing for an apology with someone else, it's usually not going to be a great experience. Right. So it's about gradually helping yourself to accept the fact that this person did hurt you and that you do, you are angry about it. You are hurt by it. And that the kind thing for you is to try to let go of it, try to move past it, to try to not let yourself get caught up in those thoughts of, of grudge, those thoughts of wishing something bad happens to them. You still get to set your boundaries. You still get to protect yourself. You still get to do whatever you need to do in order to be healthy yourself. But when you sense yourself moving into that space of anger, moving into that space where that hurt is, you try to set a boundary with yourself. No, I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm, I'm letting go of this. I do not need to be angry about this anymore. What are some techniques for letting go of that anger, though? Like, I've, I'm in, I, I don't know, some people may be know this. It's kind of something I talk around rather than explicitly state. Um, mm -hmm. This month, uh, February is the worst month for me. Um, October is mm -hmm. best month. February is worst month, and not just because yeah, ha, 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 Valentine's Day. It's um, this is the month I've experienced the most law, uh, loss, like personally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is um, my my mom died eight years ago, um, the day after Valentine's Day. Um, so you know, it it um, I struggle with it bad, and this year I've struggled with it harder than ever before. I think. You know, seasonal depression, COVID depression, my regular ass depression, they just Voltron together to become one super megazord of depression. And I'm just like fist fighting this gigantic robot 
Um, or like I shared like a me punching or like Ash Ketchum punching Mewtwo and just like, mm -hmm. like it's, that's what it, it's felt like for me. And I've, it, to be honest with, with all y'all chat gang, I, I'm not winning the fight. Like I, Monday I was a mess. Tuesday I was fine. Wednesday I was a mess. Today I'm fine. Like it's, mm -hmm. I, I'm on this pendulum swinging back and forth of not being okay. Playing Bloodborne with Mars really, really helped me escape it for a little bit but like it's like i hit the pause button and as soon as like the stream was down or i was alone with my thoughts again all of it came up and mm -hmm. you said something about like the the apology thing one of the big i think one of the big things that's just haunting me personally uh is mm -hmm. my mom was the source of a lot of pain for me um she, mm -hmm. she hurt me there, there's a lot of trauma there and eventually she lost custody of me because of the aforementioned being hurt a bunch and the state stepping in right um like, I then kind of go through this whole life spiraling, and eventually I get to a place where I'm like, I'm pretty okay with who I am and, and myself. Like, I uh, like I know that, like, I, I want to change this uh, where I am now, but I held on to a lot of that anger. So, like, mm -hmm. I'm one of the angriest people you would have ever met. Like, the chip on my shoulder, like, I could, I could cash in at... at at a casino in Vegas and, and, uh, probably buy the house. Like I had such, mm -hmm. such a stack of chips on my fucking shoulder. Um, what sucked. And I think the thing that I'm struggling with right now is she's, di she started to be a cool mom at the end. Er, cool grandma. She crappy mom. Mm -hmm. She started to be a cool grandma. She was sending my kids, uh, well, Colin, she's sending him doing that thing that I'm like, mom, why don't you just send one, Christmas card. One, no, she was actually doing that for my son. Sent a birthday card. Sent him presents. Like, mm -hmm. didn't miss any of the stuff. Sent us baby, uh, baby shower things. Pay, was helping us pay some bills. Like, being active and and it feels like I never got the apology. I never got to say what was yeah. had been haunting me forever. And so it's just been eight years of s building to mm -hmm. this monster I am now. How how do you let go of anger? Like I guess that's just I know it differs person to person, but like this is a hard time for a lot of people. It's not just me. It's sure you know this trying to like manage your expectations, your your hopefulness of these these things that help you have reprieve from the day to day, like a good AOS release. Uh, you know, hmm. playing back through Bloodborne, and, but yet you still have that anger somewhere deep inside. How that? What what are some techniques or tools like? at all sure yeah so in in general with something this deep with something this big the best place to do that to work on that is in therapy yeah so i would definitely recommend for anyone either listening to this who's recognizing you're struggling with this as well i can give you a i can give you a general path or a general thing that you can do and we'll walk through that together but i'd recommend you go and actually seek someone out this is what therapists are here for to help people process these difficult things, to learn how to engage with emotions, to learn how to engage with emotions in a healthy way. Because all of our emotions just are. They're not good or bad. They're just natural. They're forces of well, nature. Ex ex except for grudges. Yeah. Like grudges are bad. But, <laughs> anger, but anger has its place. Anger is part of how we defend ourselves. Anger can empower us and make us feel ready to actually tackle some very real threats. But when we sit in it, when we let it simmer, when we let it drive the car, yeah, we, anger only has a few ways to handle things, and they're pretty one note. Yeah, corn worst car driver ever, right? Like, you don't... <laughs> yeah. like... Take a look at the skull cannon. There's no way that thing is aerodynamic. <laughs> uh, but but in the interest of helping out, of, of helping us all out here, let me walk everyone through how we can connect with an emotion when we find this coming up from this sort of compassionate perspective. The first thing is a gentle labeling. When we recognize that emotion, we want to avoid having a reaction that is resistant in and of itself. I work with a lot of people who have anxiety, and so one of the very common responses they have is they realize they're getting anxious and go, oh shit, I'm getting anxious again. We're already rejecting the emotion. We're rejecting the fear. We actually don't want to do that because that actually makes it feel even worse. We're, not, we're now not allowed to feel how we feel. So we start with gently calling out what that is. Now, for you, we're using this example of anger. So we're going to work with anger. Oh, it's anger. Anger is what I'm feeling right now. Okay, got it. That's what's coming up for me. Part of your body might be saying, 
I'm pissed, I'm ready to throw a punch. But you, the executive you, you, the overall you, you get to choose how you relate to yourself. Yeah, that, that okay. mindful response, that second tier response, right? Like, Exactly. Oh, it's anger. Okay, anger is here. Mm-hmm. Next, we go to where is it in our body? This part may seem a little hokey, but bear with me, people. <laughs> where does the emotion live in you? Emotions are very physical. Just think of all the different terms and metaphors that we have for when we feel an emotion, like butterflies in our stomach or seeing red and things like this. So when we are feeling that emotion, where is it in us? I'm fuming, right? Like you could almost feel the heat coming off your forehead. Like you've just, finger, fists are clenched. You're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, fists are clenched. Jaw is clenched. Shoulders are tight. All of these are signs of where we're holding that emotion. So to use myself as an example, when I get angry, I feel it in my cheeks. I feel that blood rush right to my cheeks, and that's where it shows up. Yeah. So for me, if I'm thinking about being really angry, I might actually put myself in touch with that part of myself. Now, if you're watching this and you're not listening to it as a podcast, you're seeing me actually touch my cheeks. Now, if I'm in private, I might do that. I might actually put myself in contact with myself and be like, okay, I'm angry. I feel it. It's right here. Mm-hmm. But Any kind of contact can be good. Maybe you rub your temples. Maybe you just put a hand over your heart. That's sort of the classic one. Maybe even give yourself a hug. If you're feeling fear, maybe you just need that contact to help you be in touch with yourself and your body. Hmm. Now we move on to the acceptance piece. Acceptance is tough. So we want to go in both directions. We want to understand why are we feeling what we're feeling? You know, what makes sense that of all the possible emotions, we're feeling this. But we also need to recognize what makes it suck to feel this way. What makes it so hard to feel this way? Take anger, for instance. Why am I angry? Well, my mom was kind of a dirtbag at times. And I apologize if I go too far with this, but if, no, it, no, if no. it hurts, feel free to generalize to any any. No, I, I think it, using an, a concrete example for people, because I've always been very, uh, I'm rocking my I don't mind cap mental, from mm. uh, Mental Health America here. Um, I think it's one thing I learned kind of late on in the process um, is that I need to be a lot more open about mm. how I feel rather than like, Hey, imagine Mr. Fist, like, not be that guy, Uh like, because a lot of the podcasters I saw were open with their mental health, and it helped me to know their their struggle so much, because, like you're saying, mental health, we have this, I think, cultural problem where we think it's somehow not physical, it's out there floating in the ether, and I'm like, your brain is- My mind and my emotion (laughs) are separate. Yeah, I'm like, Uh and you're, you're- you just kind of laid out some concrete examples of like when you feel anger, you have these like physical things. I mean, your brain is is no less physical than your heart. You know, we treat exactly. we treat hearts with medication, therapy, change in diets, a lot of things. A lot of those same things I think help with with your mind. The difference being that like you know, if I break my arm, you can see the cast and go, okay, there's probably a broken bone or a sprain under there. If I have some some mental health issues, I'm struggling with like a the equivalent of like a sprained, uh, you know, like limbic, uh, I don't know, like right. part of the brain. Yeah, like, uh, I, have a, I have a broken heart. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a classic example. Yeah. How, how do you see that? How do you treat that? And, right. and as you said, it is all connected. Mm-hmm. Our body is us. Our brain is us. Our emotions are not just a thought that we have. They're a neurochemical response. They're a physiological response. Yeah. There are all these different layers and they're all interconnected. Yeah. So, so. so you're, you're not going to affect – I'm sorry, I didn't mean to derail you, but, yeah, you, no, feel free fine. to continue to use the example. I laid it out there because I, I believe it's important to be honest and open. Sure. So. And we can even generalize this a bit, too, that, yeah, your mom in particular was a source of pain and anger, but also all parents fail all of us. Even good, healthy parents fail their kids in some way. It's something we all face. Mm-hmm. And so part of that anger is recognizing, yeah, of course I'm pissed off at my mother. Look at all the ways in which she failed me growing up. I can't help but be mad at her. And the fact that I never got an apology makes me even more angry. Yeah. And what makes it suck to feel anger? Well, she's my mom. I wish I could love her. I wish I could connect with her. I wish she had been better. Yeah. And she wasn't. Yeah. And it sucks to feel that way towards her. Right, right. So you have like and a... then... Go ahead. Yeah, oh, go ahead. 
No, I was just saying, uh, so our three sort of three sort of steps here so far, if you just want to reset those and then, because I uh -huh. derailed it a bit. And yeah, so we've labeled the emotion, we've checked in with where the emotion lives in our body, and then we've tried to be understanding and accepting of it. I get why I would feel this way. It sucks to feel this way, but this is how I feel and that's okay. I'm not necessarily approving of it. I'm not necessarily condoning it. I'm not happy I'm pissed off, but it's okay. That's right. how I feel. Right. And then our last step is that compassion. With all of that, what do we do to be kind to ourselves? To connect with that pain and do something to alleviate it. Okay. This is where our check-in comes in here. When Soren says, I love bacon, he's actually not wrong. Self-care. <laughs> when was the last time you ate? When we're pissed off, we don't get hungry. We don't think we need to have water. When was the last time you had a meal? When was the last time you had something to drink? When was the last time you took care of your hygiene or your personal health? Last time when I was the had... last time you got some physical activity? Okay, well, now you're getting personal. It has been a few days since I showered. <laughs> <laughs> go we got him, everybody. Yeah. Two and a half hours, yeah. and we yeah. finally Boom. called him out for not Boom. showering. Yeah, there we go. We got the uh, the stinky grognard gagging. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We got him. Yeah, we got him. No, um, no, it's. I mean, having. I mean, we're. Uh, I know this is. Uh, this is one's. I I personally resent this one. Like someone telling me to go like do jumping jacks and shit when I like I get worked up. Like, dude, come on. But like, yeah, there's some truth to like doing something physical, like something yeah. active, to just get out of that. Uh, I find that I get in cycles, right, of mm -hmm. just certain patterns of behavior will lead to certain things. It doesn't have to be something as overt as, like, you know, Monday night was the night I accidentally drank too much, and it just was not the headspace I was in. We know that alcohol is kind of a bit of an inhibitor, right? Like, it, mm. it, it whatever your emotions are, basically, when you're, you're going to get locked in with alcohol is kind of its the simplest way of putting it, because it mm. can be a dep – it's mostly depressant, but it, it sometimes acts like a um, – uh, what's the opposite of depressant? Um not accelerant. Uh, stimulant. Oh, stimulant, yeah. It can act no. like a stimulant in certain, d based on what's going on like inside you already. Like, that's why like, some no. people party. It, but it's more because it is kind of blocking that stuff. So if I'm already in my, my cycle of anger, I shouldn't have had a glass mm -hmm. of wine. you know. And then right. and now I'm in that cycle of anger, and my higher brain functions have been holding down that prime anger. And now I've like had a few drinks. The higher brain functions are, are receding, and now I'm just getting angrier and angrier and soon i'm listening to like my fucking sad my sadness you, and anger you were you were mentioning a perfect circle lately and that's when we know you're getting into that sad territory right and that's oh, the thing is like yeah I, I end up looping in in a perfect circle and maynard i listen to different maynards depending on my mood if i'm listening to pussifer mm. i'm usually in a good headspace because pussifer <laughs> is, is like kind of wacky fun it's maynard's wacky fun all the voices come sure. come together to hang out band uh, if it's tool, it's usually either spiritual or angry and intelligent. Like I'm mm. contemplative, angry. This goes back to something I said at the very, very beginning of the show is is I filter the world through art. Like I, it's mm. – and if I'm on APC, there's usually like a longing, a loss, and sadness. Um, sure. And I have this problem where my anger is kind of woven with my sadness just as a right. human. Anger often protects a more vulnerable emotion. Yeah. Your anger often steps in, and so when we're connecting with the anger, what we often see is, okay, yeah, we get that you're angry. It makes a lot of sense. And also, what's that thing behind it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. um. So, so as, a, as a last note here, when we're doing that compassionate piece, sometimes it's more in the realm of self-care. Takeover Mars is mentioning that they realized that they were having some rough times and that it was, it was a little hard to eat. It was hard to, to keep food down. That's okay. You, you eat what you can, but then see what else you can do to take care of yourself. Maybe you just focus on staying hydrated. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, though, you start to get into things like positive affirmations. Trying to actually speak to that part of yourself that is hurting. And this is an area where therapy can be incredibly useful to help you figure out what makes sense. Mm -hmm. But if it's something like anger, you might even connect with that and say, well, you know, may I find peace? Mm -hmm. May I find calm? May I find a way to to cool off, mm -hmm. to actually challenge yourself to, or, or engage with that part of yourself and say, it's okay to be angry and also, may I find a way to be at peace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or I don't want to reject the anger. It has a seat at the table, 
We're just trying to find ways to also alleviate our pain. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Like you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, just uh, catching up on chat here. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Dead dead air for a podcast. Um, yeah, Mars man. Um, I. Uh, you know, Alex, Doctor Doctor Mylonis here has obviously mm -hmm. like a fantastic perspective. My my thing lately has been finding quiet moments, like just some the coffee, uh, like just uh, mm -hmm. drink my cup of coffee on my front porch. And we've been in the cold snap, so it's different. Sure. But, but like, hey, just just okay, maybe you can't eat, but finding something else. Like, uh, I I also have another technique I call the mental health burrito. Uh, based on an onion article, I don't. I think I brought this up before. Um, there's an article where uh, uh, the onion article. It's like uh, a local uh, burrito to solve local man's problems for six fucking minutes or, so, or six precious minutes or something like that. And it, it goes on to just sure. it like describe this man like taking his lunch break and buying a burrito from like Qdoba or or uh, or uh, Chipotle and actually springing for the guac because he's gonna treat himself and just sitting there eating. Right. It. Uh, I'm I'm in seasonal layoff right now, so it compounds a lot of my issues. Uh, hence the not, not showering in the last fucking three days. But uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things I do at work when I I felt that my anger boil up, uh, you know, getting mad at a contractor, pissed that I haven't gotten help when I've been asking for like a month, and I have 540 tickets compared to guy in other town only has 100. Um, mm. oh. Literally, I went and I got a, a noodles and company. And mm. uh, we're we're pretty frugal. Going to Noodles and Company is like fourteen bucks. Molly saw the Noodles and Company charge, and she didn't. If I if I buy like McDonald's, she's like Andrew, come on, no fast food, right? Mm. If I if I spend too much money at Quick Trip because I'm buying more than a cup of coffee, I'm buying like a hoagie from their hot case or whatever. It's Andrew, dude, what's up? She saw the she saw the Noodles and Company charge, or sh if she sees like the the uh, the Chipotle charge, she just she's like, how's your day? Like <laughs> she just like knows <laughs> that it, like. <laughs> I had to like the the you know obviously like emotional eating has its own thing but like sometimes man that like that freaking mental health burrito categorically that for six precious minutes I'm taking my lunch break I'm gonna fucking eat the burrito and the world is going to disappear because it is me and the burrito right now or the burrito is a metaphor <laughs> right right the, the metaphorical burrito but yeah. But you're right. One of one of the quickest ways we can connect to a compassionate space is to ask ourselves, what do I need? And sometimes you just need a few minutes to have your lunch in peace. Yeah. Sometimes you need to, you know, be able to step away. Sometimes you need to call a family member or a friend. Yeah. Sometimes you need to go listen to the Blood Bowl chat and find out what everybody's talking about. <laughs> sometimes you need to see how much has GameStop stock exploded. These are these are not these are kind of silly examples. Our needs are more they're... general. Our needs are more global. But they're for things like connection, for for being loved, for being understood and seen by others. And sometimes you just need to check in with yourself and say, I know I need some compassion. What do I need? Mm -hmm. What would help me here? Yeah. And then whatever it is, see if you can do that for yourself. Uh, take over Mars dropping three thousand RDP. Remind everyone that chat gang ain't nothing to fuck with. Once we get a certain number, it's no longer mess with, it's fuck with. Um, um, yeah, parenting does often suck, Soren. You're not wrong. And parent finding quiet moments as a parent, um, the emotional bandwidth Molly and I were both at today, like, was super diminished. And, like, the kids were just being normal kids, but there's a lot of loudness to normal kids. And, like, it's sure. it is constant. If someone can ever find... The, the like okay no that's a horrible line of thought but children mm -hmm. have a, this energy about them and i just wish i could bottle some of that and just like you know what i guess, well, guess what i'm saying is i wish i were a necromancer and i had dark <laughs> magics <laughs> because i could solve the world's energy crisis if i could somehow find a way the essence of what makes a child ability ability to go from freaking sun up to sun down and beyond on just they they, they get tired and they get more energy it's amazing. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> uh, there's a, a documentary you may want to watch called Monsters Inc. Oh, is that, that what it is? Yes, that's, that's the one. Yeah, this documentary Monsters Inc. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But yeah, and you know, I I definitely hear you on that. Yeah, 
as you may be able to attest, although we've only typically met in like bigger public settings, I can be a loud human being. Mm -hmm. And so I pity myself and my wife when eventually we have children, because I assume their volume will be permanently stuck somewhere between nine and 11 <laughs> out of 11. Well, I mean, this, here's a study for you. I, I find that children's volumes, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of an anomaly, uh, actually, because I, I was a very quiet kid, but I'm very loud now. Um, but usually the yeah, we have to make up time we spend so many years as children being quiet and observing god damn it if we're going to be heard yeah now. yeah but I, I find the volume of the individual you can directly track how, how loud their house was like my friend keegan is <laughs> like one of the loudest humans i know and his house is they they speak and yelling like they're right. they're, they're, yes. they're like never in the same room so they're always yelling you know and i'm just <laughs> like, like they have a big house so they have to yell particularly loud to like talk right. to each other and um, uh... <laughs> yeah, if you, you don't yell you don't get heard yeah that's it they, this and... is actually a really common issue in couples therapy of like you they yell at me whenever they they have a problem they're like well yeah because in my household there were 12 of us and if you didn't yell then it was assumed it wasn't important it's like well yeah but there's only two of us so please stop yelling at me <laughs> interesting um, amazing amazing uh, sometimes you need to ridicule a frozen pizza company online. Yeah, sometimes you just gotta tee off. On... <laughs> you know what, Mr. Coffee? You did sell me a bad coffee maker, and I am gonna leave you a bad review. I need to be heard. Yeah. Oh, this is why Yelp is like, it's, it, I, it's, I wonder if it's like therapy for, for these people who just like, they need to be angry. But like, righteous indignation is one of the greatest, this is why Rantcast exists, by the way. Right, <laughs> righteous <laughs> indignation is one of the greatest human emotions. The, the like, you know, this is why I yell at Nazis, because I know I am empirically correct to yell about Nazis being bad. Like, I just, there's, <laughs> like, right. there's, there's so, like, you're so in that moment where, like, you're just, you're, you're filled to the top, uh, to the brim with righteous indignation and just yelling or ranting about it. Like, on Yelp, you're just like, my food was cold, and you're just, like, mad. Oh, it feels so good. And then it's, no. like, and then it's gone. And you're like, <sighs> and, like... That's. <laughs> however, however, we do need to say it's never good to abuse other people to cause more pain. You can go on and say, my food was cold. I was disappointed. It wasn't the best service. You know, I wish it had been better. But if you go on and say, this server is a, and then as many. Yeah, bleep, 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 bleep. Uh, yeah, I hope they, I hope they trip. Uh, I hope they, uh. I hope they drink a like accidentally drink a glass of knives. Like as soon as you start to right. go into that territory, I think you're. I mean, this it's not is helpful for this anyone. is the, the people getting disappointed with with the the FAQ. Like what FAQ, right? Ha mm -hmm. ha ha. And actually going to personally attack people. That that's not. I that's think, not helpful. where you ever go. And I don't condone um, that type of behavior personally. Like this is why people like start joking about chat mob or or chat cult. Right. Like, I never wanted to get to that. The minute I say something on the internet and people that like, you know, identify as chat gang go and like attack somebody in the community or they think they're doing it on my behalf, I know that I have failed as a content creator and I need to go back to my basics, maybe think about stopping because that's just, I never want to personally inflict more harm in the world. My goal is, is to do more good than, right. you know, like it's, I think that's where maybe the compassion comes in is just, you know, even when I can feel these super volatile emotions, thinking about the situation in the long run being to to do the most good and not the no, and not bad, like to not hurt, to not put extra hurt out there. You know, I feel hurt and I want to lash out, but like if I do, all I've done is amplified the hurt. And that's right. that's not necessarily the best. I One of the most the most primitive foundational ways we have to communicate our pain is by inflicting that pain on other people. As a communication method, it works, but as a way of connecting with others, it sucks. Yeah, the person will understand your pain and they will hate you for it. Hmm. So we need to think about that, especially with anger when anger is defending pain. To lash out at others with that pain, it doesn't actually help in the long run doesn't take more pain out of the world what am i doing with my and life? and as with soren says i love ikea yeah i love ikea and that's the perfect transition speaking of ikea yeah. how you speaking build stuff IKEA. that that they give you 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 have to build the stuff uh we have some list builds here <laughs> to, we get, do. To, we to, do. to increase We're... the joy in in the world right now 
<laughs> in terms of the smoothness of our transitions, we moved from smooth peanut butter to chunky peanut butter to just peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a great speaking <laughs> of like I've been working like I, I've been listening to some podcasters out there and they have some fantastic uh, uh, Ben Kissel from uh, last podcast on the left. He has some of the greatest segues ever because <laughs> they're so hokey and bad. And that's <laughs> the joke. So like speaking of Ikea. And then, like, he'll, like, it's, what's, like. Ikea, building things, lists. We got it. <laughs> yep, boom. Everybody. Building things, building lists. Like, I'm like, oh, Ben Kissel would have been proud. Like, that transition right there. Oh, put it, oh, beautiful, beautiful. Um. So, <laughs> so, everyone, allow, allow me to introduce you to not just list science, but mad list science. Right. As uh, I think Brendan put it, he's not the man who asks whether he should he just asked if he can. Right. And that is the purpose of this. <laughs> we are looking at the anti-synergies. We are looking at the things that you can do, but you probably shouldn't. Our goal is not necessarily to say that these things are good and that you should go out and do them, but just to highlight different things when we take things to the nth degree or utilize certain strategies available to us and realize, oh, right, there's a reason no one does this. Sometimes we hit a gem. A lot of times we don't, but it's <laughs> fun along the way. Well, you got you to push the envelope. you got to experiment. you got to think like this. Because if you're good at finding non-bows and non-synergies, I mean, you're just one shift in the gears away from finding good ones. <laughs> yes. If you look at one of these lists and you realize, right, there's a reason this is terrible, then as you're reading through a battle tome or as you're looking at someone else's army list, you can look at something and say, all right, don't go there because I know that doesn't work for a reason. So now I can just ignore that ability or ignore that thing. Or you see that show up in someone else's list and you wonder, what the hell are they doing? Or you hide Either I have no idea what pain that's about to be inflicted on me or I have a pretty good idea of this, how this isn't going to work. All right. So the first one we've got here, I've got your, uh, uh, your wa. well, yeah, I think you know which one. The Casino Cats, if you can. Yes, just... the Wampus, the Wampus Lords Casino Cats. These <laughs> are. Tempest Lords, who've clearly been spending a lot of time with their Iron Jaws friends. So, back in the day, old Iron Jaws used to have this sort of casino approach where you would get as many command points as you could, you would use an Aether Quartz brooch, and you would just dump all of it into their WA command ability to add extra attacks, yeah. and then hope that you rolled the new command points to add more and more attacks. Yeah, this was uh, right, right after a GHB change, right before their battle tome. It was the to me, it was peak Auric War. It was it was peak Iron Jaw play for me. Like it was the most sure. destruction. It was probably actually toxic because if you had enough uh, like <laughs> po poker checks to like cat like to just cash out on somebody, you would just you had so many combat. It was probably like too good, but I thought it was it was so random. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it worked or it didn't, and when. It it was devastating, and when it didn't, you were like, well, yes, I die. And so you decided that, like, you missed that a bunch, and so you built this as, as a Stormcast list. <laughs> Correct. So, there's a few Storm hosts out there that we hear of pretty frequently. They show up in lists. Uh, Hammers of Sigmar, Anvils of the Helden Hammer are the two that show up a lot. We sometimes see Celestial Vindicators, um, and so we don't often see some of the other Storm hosts that are around, like Tempest Lords. Part of the reason for that is that Tempest Lord specifically is really good at command point generation, but Stormcast don't necessarily have a lot of places to spend those command points, except for the Lord Arcanum on Dracoline. So to walk everyone through the list in total before we look at some particular areas, we're a Stormcast Eternals army, and specifically we are a Stormkeep army which is the new allegiance from Broken Realms Marathi, which changes some of our allegiance abilities. Um, we don't get to deploy from the heavens, but our liberators get some bonuses. They can boost their save. We can pull Cities of Sigmar units in if we want to, and they can potentially benefit from some things. Although in this list, we haven't done that. You absolutely could, but in this case, we haven't. So we're a Stormcast army. We are a Stormkeep army, and we are a Tempest Lord's army. Now, we have as our leaders a Lord Arcanum on Dracoline, who's our general, who has the command trait that comes from the Tempest Lords, which I have pulled up. Well, I'll come back to it. Um, and they have an artifact, the Mirror Shield, 
2017 Stormcast called. They want their artifact back. <laughs> um, we have the Celestial Blades and the Mount Trait Pride Leader. Now, because we also have the Battalion Wardens of the Stormkeep, we are able to take a Lord Celestine on foot and then up to five other Stormcast heroes in that battalion. So uh, we have a Lord Celestine on foot, we have our Lord Arcanum, we have a Castellant, an Exorcist, and I've gone for two Knight Venators, but, I mean, you can swap in any Stormcast heroes you want. Why did you go with the Venators here, out of curiosity? My idea with the Venators is our other units are all melee, so the Venator is a nice little shooting platform for only 110 points, so it gives you some ability to project power out onto the field um, through their shooting attacks, and they get a once-per-game ability to potentially do a lot of damage to a hero. Mm -hmm. So it just gives you a little bit more flexibility. They also move really quickly, so their effective threat range is actually quite high. Okay. But okay. you could easily swap them for a... Um, like on a relictor in order to get access to prayers um you can put in really any of the on foot heroes you want here and you can even play around with the number of them you don't have to take six heroes in this battalion uh i just decided to do that you... for reasons that will be explained um, but you could certainly play around with the heroes you take with this with this uh list you could grab if you if you felt like you could grab a uh a, a, a knight invocator and go for like a a, co a comic combo real quick you drop Absolutely. you drop one hero, drop in that in your comet, and you have got that combo ready to go for the most part. So, so you could do that for if sure. you want some projection too. All right. Yeah, swap out a knight venator for a uh, knight encanter. Uh, take the comet, and there you go. Now I have an exorcist who is a spellcaster in here, um, but since all of the stormcast heroes for the most part only get one spell, and I've given them a spell I want them to use, you would probably have to take another wizard if you wanted to get the comet off regularly. Right, right. So for our actual units here, we have three units of five Liberators, which are our battle line, and then a unit of nine Evocators on Dracolines. Now, just for the purposes of example for this list, I just made one big unit of them, but you could break them up into MSU, or you could reduce the number and then free up those points for something else, because they are quite expensive. No, no, this is the way. 780 points into nine Evocators on Dracoline. The thund the aptly named Thundercats, uh, like. <laughs> Correct. Yes, very much. This is this is a Thundercats build. So, all right, we've we've said everything that's here. So, what's the gimmick? Well, with this list, with this battalion, the Wardens of the Stormkeep, the special ability you get is that at the beginning of the first battle round, you get to at the start of your first hero phase, actually. You get to roll a dice for every hero in the battalion. And I have the book pulled up on my phone here. You add three to the roll for uh, for your general. And for every five up, you get a command point. So at the start of your very first hero phase, you have a chance to get six command points. Now, on average, you probably won't get six. Since it's a five up, your general is doing it on a two up. But you'll get two or three pretty regularly. And... Since you're Tempest Lords, one of your uh, one of your special abilities is, in your hero phase, you get a chance to get an extra command point. And we took a battalion, and we bought an extra command point. So all total, you're looking at, a, if you get a really optimal turn, you are looking at starting off with about nine command points. Mm -hmm. The Lord Arcanum on Dracoline has a command ability. It's an 18-inch bubble. And every time you use that command ability... Hol holy within or holy within, or just 18? Holy within, but it's an 18-inch holy within bubble. Okay. So that's, that's a pretty generous bubble. Every time you use that command ability, every evocator on Dracoline within 18 inches gets to add an attack on its mount, specifically. So the mounts are the ones who get an extra attack. So we're now giving them nine extra attacks. And the Aether Quartz brooch doesn't exist anymore... But the Tempest Lords have an artifact that, when you spend a command point, you have a chance to get it back. That artifact is on our Exorcist, who's sitting on his own, in a forest somewhere, sitting on a two-up save on, in cover, casting Stormcaller, which just is a spell that hits the whole table every turn. So <laughs> far away from combat. And every command point, he's like, hmm, I'll give it to you. Yeah, you can have that one back. 
no, not that one, but the next one. You can keep it. <laughs> so I'm sure you're all thinking, okay, well, that, that attack profile on those draft lines must be pretty good. It's threes and threes, rend one, damage one. So now it's like, oh, well, is it really that big of a deal to give them that many extra attacks? Well, on the charge, it's D3 damage. Yeah. So now you get this unit that can also cast Empower on itself. So now they're rerolling their wounds. You can cast um, Celestial Blades on them, which gives them plus one to their wounds. You'll notice on this list I give them Speed of Lightning. Ignore that spell. They already reroll their charges. But since you've got so many command points, you can make them run and charge. You can make them, at least I think you can make them run and charge. Um, you can make them, you might not be able to do that, but you can make them run. You can make them reroll their charge natively. You don't have to spend a command point. And when they get in there, in addition to all the attacks their riders get, you're getting anywhere from up to 12, extra, 12 attacks on their monster's claws, and each of those attacks is D3 damage at run one. Plus, the uh, Avocators themselves can explode for their mortal wounds uh, in, a, in a pickle, in a pinch. Yep. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, we haven't even talked about the mortal wounds that the Avocators do after they attack, or the attacks from the Riders themselves. All that's extra. <laughs> and every time you spend one of those command points, you might just get it right back. I think it's fun just to, like, recreate a little bit of, like, the, uh, um, <laughs> just a little bit of the, uh, the casino... Uh, orcs uh, play style, which was always fun. Just uh, Gorgruntas or uh, brutes, whatever it was you were bringing to the t to the party, and just like smashing them into somebody. Um, mm -hmm. You're not needing to make three inch charges, but natively re rolling charges is is a pretty good uh, pretty good deal. Um, and they're and you've got you've got a twelve inch move speed, so they move pretty quick. Yeah, evocators are decently quick, so yeah, our dracoline are decently quick, so you can uh you can project some power. You absolutely can. And if you wanted to, as I was saying, you could break them up into MSU. I think on Twitter I posted just a thought experiment there, and I had a unit of three of them doing 50 wounds. <laughs> and not, not something to sneeze at. Yeah. You could, you could easily swap out one of these heroes and try to fit in um, another Arcanum on Dracoline, because them being the general doesn't really change their ability to use that command ability. You just need one of them within 18 inches of the Epicator. So you can get another one for redundancy, but with Mirror Shield giving them minus two to be shot, it's not that easy to remove them. Yeah. I, I actually, and, I like the idea of a Relictor. And the Leader also buffs the, the Dracolines again in another way. Uh, what does Pride Leader do? I am just going to quickly pull that up. So why don't you go ahead and share your thought here. Yeah, I actually like the idea of a Relictor in here because you can teleport it then like you can you can teleport mm -hmm. the unit um obviously you take some pre-move with your with your uh celestial drac uh your with your lord arcanum but you're just gonna like auto six run that someplace and have the 18 inch bubble set up and then just teleport a unit of dracoline someplace to just blow up the thing i like that um and you're yeah, rolling the charge i like i like i don't mind the uh try to uh try twice at a nine inch charge you know especially if i've got an msu to where like okay like yeah, I don't make the charge this turn, but you charge that, then I'm going to counter charge you with the second unit. So, so, Sure. And Pride Leader is add one to hit rolls for friendly Dracolines wholly within nine inches. Not bad. So you could have them at two up, two up, re-rolling the, the two up to wound, rend one, D3 damage with ten plus attacks. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Yes. Um. As long as you keep that Arcanum on Dracoline alive and some Evocators alive, you just keep doing it. <laughs> and, and, and we put the Celestin in there to just toss a cheeky plus one to save on that big unit while they're there, while they're nearby. Well, the, the fun part of this is is really just, we like we had Sarah McLaughlin playing when Aether Quartz Brooch was removed from the world. It was too beautiful for this world. Um, you get to ha have that enjoyment back. Um you do, yeah, and you are one of the only people who get to have that back. Beasts of Chaos have the knowing eye, baby. <laughs> they do, they do, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a... Uh, it's just Lords a... Beasts of Chaos, those things heating up the meta. Yeah, it's, well, it's, they get, it's, theirs is just a once per turn, and it's not every time you use it, but it's, it still feels good. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does. 
Uh, Van Breck's Alpha Chunker <laughs> is the next one we I got here. I tried to come up with a better name for this one, especially since I have Croak in the list. I was trying to think of some frog puns, but I couldn't think of one. So if you've got a better pun name out there, go ahead. Yeah, leave it in the comments below this video. <laughs> give, give us your puns, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So when the Storm Cape, Stormkeep rules came out and people got to see some of the different battalions, one of them allows you to basically, at the start of the first battle round, you pick up your whole, uh, what can basically be your whole army, and just redeploy it anywhere on the table, including nine inches away from the enemy. So what people are using that for right now is to put 60 liberators in front of the opponent's army and basically say like, okay, get through that. That's your game. Those are your turns. But we've decided, nah, we're too cool for that. That's, that's not us. That's too boring. We have gone instead for the named version of that battalion, Van Brecht's Black Watch, which is a different idea, but some of the abilities are the same. So once again, we are a Stormcast army, we are Stormkeep Allegiance, and we are an Anvils of the Heldenhammer Stormhost, because I don't know if it's required for Van Brecht's Black Watch, but, I mean, why wouldn't you be? Um, oh, units from this battalion must have the Anvils of the Heldenhammer keyword. So we had to take it anyway for the battalion, but you would, since we're mostly ranged units. We have a Lord Veriton, who is our one and only Stormcast hero, who is Ventbrecht, so we can't give him any, any artifacts. He has his own command trait, which helps him out against vampires, which, sure, why not? That's helpful. And as an ally, we have Lord Crook. The rest of the Ventbrecht's battalion is this unit of 20 Judicators with Boltstorm crossbows and four of the Thunderbolt crossbows, which I guarantee most of you have probably never seen on a Judicator if you've ever seen one before. We have five more Judicators with the regular bows, five Liberators, 18 Castigators, which is a full-size unit of Castigators, which also none of you have ever seen on the table, I'm sure, and six Griffhounds. So what this... We also have the Bailwind Vortex because we have Croak. I mean, who doesn't, right? If you're taking Croak, you're taking the Bailwind. So what this battalion does, after setup, but before the first battle round, you get to pick up everything from the battalion and redeploy it anywhere on the board. You start by setting up the Lord Veriton, and then, and he has to be, or they have to be nine away from the enemy. And then you have to set up the other units wholly within 12 of the Lord Veriton and nine away. Now, that's not a ton of board space, but you can probably figure out how to do it. And if you can't, you can always shift some numbers around. So what we have here is we have now put 20 Judicators actually within range of the enemy for their crossbows. And since they're not moving, they weren't set up that turn. They didn't move that turn. They got set up before that first turn even occurred. They are going to get their extra shot. So they're now getting four attacks apiece. And on top of that, the way that the special crossbows work is that you roll a dice based on the number of models in the unit that you're targeting. And if your dice roll is less than the number of models in the unit, I believe, you deal D3 mortal wounds. Hmm. And I'm just double checking that to be sure that I'm reading that right. Oh yeah, so if the unit didn't move in the previous turn, they get plus one to their attacks. And the Thunderbolt crossbow um, doesn't get attacked, so it doesn't benefit from that. But as long as you roll a dice and the result is equal to or less than the number of models in the unit, that unit takes D3 mortal wounds. You do get to subtract one from the roll if the target is a monster. So if you're targeting a big monster that's only one model, you actually do have a chance to still deal the mortal wounds to it. <laughs> so the start of your first turn you drop all of this in front of the, your opponent. You chuck 60-some-odd shots at them. You chuck four sets of D3 Mortal Wounds at some different units. Not to mention the Castigators themselves. While they're only one shot apiece, they are threes and threes, uh, rend one, damage one, either getting rend two on their shots or rerolling ones to hit. Mm -hmm. And all of these units that are shooting, with uh, since your anvils, can make them shoot in the hero phase. Mm -hmm. So they get to do it all again in the shooting phase after shooting in the hero phase. <laughs> 
On top of that, Castigators are actually not bad in melee. They are two attacks apiece of fours and fours. So you put the line of Castigators in front, you keep the Judicators behind them, and then your opponent actually has to chew through all of those Castigators to get to the rest of the stuff while getting shot constantly the whole time. Meanwhile, your Griff Hounds, your other five Judicators, your other Liberators can run around grabbing objectives, and Croak can happily sit in the middle of the table just nuking whatever he feels like. Croak so we picked, a, Go ahead. we picked a Vampire Hunter, we gave him a bunch of guns, we gave him an Undead Frog to back him up, and now we got a buddy comedy. <laughs> I like that you just, you basically took the Van Hels uh, the uh, Hugh Jackman Van Helsing movie, um, and you made a list. Because he even has the, like, the repeater crossbow, and he just did, 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 you know, he's just shooting it like a machine gun. Um, you just made that the list. <laughs> Basically, yes. And I mean, how can you turn down a chance to do, between the Thunderbolt crossbows and Croak, 12 D3 mortal wounds to a unit. So you went with the, the bolts from uh, crossbows basically for volume uh, over, uh, yeah. <laughs> Correct. Instead of, instead of over reliability or accuracy or any of those other considerations. Yeah, those important no, things, no, no, no. yeah. No, 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 no. We just went with, with raw shot output here. <laughs> and the, the bolts from crossbows are not bad. They, are, they only have a 12-inch reach, which is why we've had to use this battalion to actually really get much mileage out of them. Right. And there'll be four attacks apiece, threes and fours, no rend damage one. So they're not dealing a ton of damage, but that's enough shot volume going out that you're going to hit something. Yeah. It's, it's funny because this feels a little bit like a um, Stormcast do KO. Like, <laughs> right. like they're, they're, um, it like, is not the best Stormcast shooting list. No, it is not even the best Stormcast Castigator list. I might argue, <laughs> but it is a fun way to put some models on the table that probably people don't see very often, and croak because we might want to win a game. Yeah, there you go, there you go, um, and the final one is your boldest list because this is the one that uh, in three days. <laughs> This, this is a long shot, ladies and gentlemen. In three days, there is a new Daughters of Cain battle tome, and I have written a Daughters of Cain list. So that's the time span you have to get your games in. Good yeah. luck. Yeah, this is, this is my favorite name of all. Uh, <laughs> snake? Snake? Snake! <laughs> <laughs> Shoutouts to, so to MGS. <laughs> so it's a, it's a snake build. Um, also, this one is a successor build to a... A build I made that I was very proud of, and I've even mentioned on Rancast, which was the Star Drake that kills you for trying to kill it. Where I stacked every damage reflection ability I could find on a Star Drake and made it so that, say, a skeleton took a stab at it, instead of dealing one wound, it took four mortal wounds back. Yep. So this is my my successor build. I like to think these snakes are descended from that Star Drake. <laughs> I love it. So. So we are a Daughters of Cain army. We are in Hagnar, because of course we are. But we have a reason. At least we have a reason for why we've done it. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Temple Nest Battalion, made up of a Bloodrack Shrine. Um, we have 20 Blood Sisters, which are the melee uh, Malusai, the melee snakes. Mm -hmm. 10 Blood Sisters, 5 Blood Stalkers, another 5 Blood Stalkers, which are the ranged ones. That makes up our battalion. We also have a Slaughter Queen on Cauldron of Blood. We have Morgwaith the Bloody, so we have Morgwaith's Blade Coven here, the named one from Shadespire. And then we also have ten Witch Elves with uh, Bladed Bucklers to round out our battle line. So what makes this the successor to that build I talked about is we've created a giant block of 20 Blood Sisters. Now the downside to using a big block of models like that is that it's very easy to catch them on other things. You know, you take... 10 Ungor Raiders and toss them into one of those Blood Sisters, and now the whole line gets messed up. Mm -hmm. Which is why we've put them in a Temple Nest. In the Temple Nest, every time you make an attack roll against one of the units from that battalion, if you roll a 1 to hit, you take a mortal wound. So if you try and throw random units against that big unit of Blood Sisters, now all of a sudden you're actually taking wounds back from even making the attempt. Plus, they are no slouches in melee. 
even if they can only get a few of them in on one model or two models, just a few of them can put out enough wounds to really mess up something, especially since we have Mind Razor to give them, which yeah. bumps them up to potentially dealing two damage apiece. Well, the, the new Mind Razor is also, uh, it, it doesn't have the bravery necessity anymore. It's just it's just set it and forget it. It's a, it's a minor buff. So if a lot of this other stuff still works in the new book, uh, you've got a slight buff in, in terms of Mind Razor. We might, yes. Some of this stuff might actually hold up in the new book. I haven't heard any leaks or any rumors yet, so who knows? Grain of salt on the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. But of course, we are in Hagnar. So now we have this unit of 20 Blood Sisters who have a 5-up save, and if they're near the general, they get their 5-up damage prevention roll, or after save, or ward save, whatever phrase you like. Since we have... The, uh, since we have the prayer, the Blessing of Cain, which I believe is the right one, but we have the prayer in this list to re-roll that save. Mm -hmm. So now there are five up uh, with a re-rollable five up damage prevention. But of course we have a Cauldron of Blood, so now there are four up with a re-rollable five up damage prevention, and they deal mortal wounds back to you if you roll poorly when you try to hit them. Right. We've given the Bloodrack Shrine... Uh, which allows us, which is our general, we've given them 1001 Dark Blessings, so that shrine gets a plus one from that artifact, and a plus one from the Slaughter, from the slaughter Queen, and a five up after save. So it's at a three up save, with a five up after. So not only is it hard to remove the Blood Sisters themselves, it's hard to remove the general that's protecting them, and you're taking those mortal wounds back if you try. Right, right. And we're making it easier to get our prayers off by giving the Slaughter Queen the Iron Circlet. And if you try and go for something else, well, the Bloodstalkers can put out some range damage. And the Witch Elves have Blade Bucklers, so they'll also bounce Mortal Wounds back to you if you try to attack. <laughs> so no matter what you're trying to pick a fight with in this army, you're either taking a lot of damage in the process from your attempt, or taking a lot of damage in the process from them on their actual turn. Yeah, right. Right. It, you just you're giving your opponent only bad decisions to make effectively. Now, those of you who have considered these types of defensive death stars have probably realized the problem which is they just don't fight the bad thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the issue that you may run into with this type of list. That was the issue I ran into with my Star Drake. When people realize it's going to deal four, to mo four mortal wounds back to you, they just don't fight that thing. Yeah. Yeah. But luckily here, we have enough other threats on the table that we might be able to force them to pick fights they don't want. And even if somehow they wipe out that unit of 20 Blood Sisters, our whole plan still works pretty well on 10 Blood Sisters. Right, right. And, I mean, you're still going to try to dictate fighting with your, your Blood Sisters. You're going to try to pick some engagements that are beneficial to you. Um, and exactly. And get them on the, on the slap back. Yeah. Yeah. Um. <laughs> We'll see. Um, you'll have to like do a 2.0 of this when that book comes out. We'll see if it uh, if it holds up. Um, I've seen a couple minor minor leaks uh, myself, and I'm like, uh, but not enough to, to tell um, what's going on. the The word on the street is that they didn't get worse. So <laughs> I, I will take it as a new Daughters of Game player. I will take it. Yeah, Slanesh is the interesting one. So we'll see. Actually, in two weeks, I'll be on Vince Venturello's uh, show. He's gonna, uh, he's doing the Slanesh uh, Battle Tome review, so I'll be on there for that. Um, nice. So I we'll... did see, I did see a leak of Sigvald's War Scroll. Did you get a chance to see that one? Yeah. Um. The it's six really interesting. Six wounds feels he's he's too expensive. Like uh, right out, he's he's too expensive. Um. But the six wounds feels a little light with a four up after save and a three up armor save. Um, mm -hmm. but I do like the, char the number of attacks equal to either five or the charge roll, which is pretty sweet. So like, that... and he gets a, a flat plus three to charge if I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I think, uh, I think that's pretty cool. Like he's, I mean, you're, you're looking at a melee foot hero. That's just an undesirable place to be in as a, as a sculpt, as a model in, in, in Warhammer. But I only need an excuse to play the cool thing. Right, like that's. <laughs> I'm just like in all Warhammer is is me looking for an excuse to play the cool stuff, and uh, just give for me sure. an excuse and then I'll play it. And so I think Sigvald, you've got you've got more than an excuse to play him because his model is. Uh, I mean, this is the S tier model. There's there's a handful of them, 
out there, this was this is one of them. Uh, they redid depravity to be basically you just get all oh, depravity if you deal damage, uh, and mm -hmm. the, the the chart has been adjusted. It you're gonna summon a good amount, but you're gonna only have about eighty wounds on the table to start with. So it's mm -hmm. um, they've done some stuff with it that uh, they are very far from the power they were before. But perhaps we have now shifted them back enough that they are now they're well into the fat middle. I again. think they're I think they're playable. Uh, I I mean I'll save my ultimate read until I've read the right. the battle tome in 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 totality, like holistically. Um, it's my early read on just what I've seen so far, which is allegiance abilities and a couple war scrolls. Uh, with the uh, with the assumption that their other war scrolls probably aren't changing too much, the ones that I haven't mm -hmm. seen. Um. My read is that they're going to be bottom of the fat middle. Uh, the problem is, is their natural predators are here in force, and unless AOS 3.0 changes their natural predators, uh, they're going to have a bad time. Like the 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 shoot the heroes, ha ha ha, that stuff was coming down the pipeline, and and then it got here, and yeah. now all their natural predators are here. The other combat armies uh, are combatier. <laughs> like, um. Yeah, for for an army for an army like them, traditionally they haven't really had great ways to defend themselves. There are glass cannon. Melee they should armies. be, and they should be. They yeah. should they should live live fast, you know, die die young type thing where they just right. uh, they. But scream. now, yeah. now some of them actually have armor. Yeah. So that'll be interesting to see how that changes things. Yeah, I mean that could be cool. Um, I think the archers are going to be great with the new depravity. Yeah, I mean, you're reaching out and touching someone for depravity, which is pretty cool. They changed the locust to not be horribly toxic. Um, it is on a four up, uh, you can't pile in. The unit can't pile in. So they mm -hmm. changed it to that. Um, you've It's a three up on your greater daemons now. So like locust of depravity got a, got a big nerf, but I mean, that was the mechanic that was, I think, the most hated mechanic of all time. Um, like the yeah. single, the single most hated ability, which was, which was activation wars shenanigans, but it's such a redundant oppressive level that like, um, Sigvald always yeah. strikes first off the charge. So Sigvald does get that, but that's a single model. That's fine. It's off yeah. the charge, which we're okay with, with flesh eater courts. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I, if you get it, if I, if I outplay you and I get my charge off because I'm trying to play the game and you're trying to play the game, that's fine. Um, right. And now, and it's, I mean, go ahead. Screens are a thing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah you might get the first turn in that charge, but yeah. maybe I yeah. force you to win that on a screen. Well, what's cool with Sigvald, and again, it's overcosted. Like I'm just gonna get that out of the way. But what's cool with Sigvald is so like if you do, it, uh, he should be a demon prince, as I recall. So he should have the greater demon keyword. So he's gonna be the three up for the locust. Uh, you're in an interesting position where you can now take this thing that can have like nine attacks with a pretty decent weapon profile charge mm -hmm. into chaff and wipe it and or not get killed on the clapback because it can't pile in. So mm -hmm. like you you have the single model that tags the side of like a block of 40, you know, like just on the little like corner, you blow them up and they can't pile back in to like really get the swing back you want to see. So it's he uh -huh. he's going to feel like that sort of like uh the the du the classic duelist where like he's just pos positioning for like a good angle to strike you at and then when he does strike inflict the most damage which i think is a huge win for the model um it doesn't feel so yeah. much like a hero hunter which is where those foot troops seem to, to to settle in i think uh yeah and it's always it's always a difficult space in age of sigmar to have those sort of assassin characters yes because since you are a battlefield since we're dealing at the army scale those characters just have a really hard time being functional at their job of you know, being able to reach an enemy hero or a sensitive enemy unit and then actually strike and strike hard. It seems like Sigvald might have enough tools at his disposal to make that possible for him. Yeah. As but we'll we'll have to see. As long as the rest of the Slanesh kit is there to, you know, where they're 420 blazing it across the table. Like, <laughs> you, you, right. you're playing fair because I don't believe he flies. Um, I, 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 didn't, I didn't look that closely at, I guess, the he flies uh, it. He flies in our hearts. Yeah, he really. does. He, um, but like uh, I I I can't remember I, I I skimmed over I didn't see if I saw the fly I was looking at the new mechanics more than like to see if it had fly I don't believe he flies uh Slanesh tends to not fly that's just 
tends that's to true. Be. That tends to be one of the limits that they face is that they don't tend to get flying, but they move very quickly. And I think that's a fair ba- that's a fair trade. Yeah. Like I, I play a bunch of Beast of Chaos. Like uh, I'm gonna get my charge. It's just like you need to position well so that I don't get to charge the juicy bits or like it's you're gonna have a bad time. And that's called playing the game of Age of Sigmar. That's fine. I don't mind that. Um, so like he, it's an interesting design space. I I still think Tenebriel Shard brought pulled off the hero assassin thing the best of any mm-hmm. any to this like foot troop type thing uh gotrick has a similar feel but gotrick's mm-hmm. downside is that he's the terminator he can only walk toward you right yeah gotrick yeah. is less of an less of an assassin and more of choose a unit delete it it's it's a t- it's a t- he's just this it, he is inevitability like he's just he's gonna right. if he gets to the thing that's dead um, and I love that. I love that design space for Gotrick. I'm like, yeah, that like, cause if it could get to the thing all the time and that thing is always dead, now you're, it's, it's unbalanced, but he gets to do infinite damage and, and what makes him fair is that it takes him a while to do infinite damage, you know, like I, and I, yeah. and it's a single model and you chaff single models or you run away from them. So I think that that's balanced. I, they have some tools to, to make some of these, these foot slogging single model hero like assassiny types, pretty cool. Sigvald's in an interesting space. Knock his points down, hmm. and you've got a winner, like an absolute winner. Um, but I'll save a lot of my takes on Smash for the uh, when sure. I've read the Battle Tome and when I'm on Vince's show. So um, to come full circle back to Path to Glory, if you any of you have those foot heroes that you feel like you never really got a chance to play, Path to Glory is actually a great chance to break them out because that might be all you fit or all you get to fit into your army there. I've actually had a lot of really fun moments when I have an Ogroid Thaumaturge who got charged by five Dawn Riders, and they would almost kill him, or like get him down to one wound, and guess what he gets to do when he takes any damage? Reroll all hits and all wounds. Yeah. And he's no slouch in melee combat, so he has soloed units of Dawn Riders several times in our <laughs> campaign. Or like, I put him behind some acolytes, and then when people charge in, it's like, oh, you're not, I'm not stuck in here with you guys. You're stuck in here with me. Yeah. You thought this objective would be easy. Also, by the way, I cast a spell that does D6 mortal wounds and heals me for it. Yeah, yeah. He's so, a, a sweet-looking model, too. Like, super sweet. Right. So any of those foot heroes you never get a chance to play, see if you can't convince some friends to play Path to Glory. You'll get a chance to actually break them out. Yeah, that between that and Anvil of Apotheosis, I think you have some good excuses. It's I I feel fortunate because I'm in a place where I've I've settled in what, like with my armies and I'm like I can keep this army tuned and powerful. When it does come to Slanesh, I, I'm I'm building it for my pleasures. It has not like mm-hmm. I'm not even looking at the most viable thing. I'm going to be like I want to fill this up with two thousand points of the the stuff that I think looks the coolest. A great tragedy of our game is that that that's not viable in the end. One day See, we'll we'll get to runners. <laughs> Yeah. Ugly as sin. Continue to get better with every book. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I wish the reality were that things were there was a bit more parody in your own battle tome, <laughs> right? Um, because then that Neapolitan build strategy, I think, that feels like a healthy place to be. It doesn't need to be the best, but it, again, just give me an excuse, right? Like, give me an sure. excuse. Um, and my excuse right now is cool models, but you don't want to feel like an idiot for fielding just cool models and seeing that they just they just fight with pillows, right? Like, you don't... Right, yeah. You 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 know, you want that feeling like I can go three and two just bring in the coolest stuff. You know, like, I'm, I'm not going to be at the top tables beat-facing people, and if I run into those top table beat-face lists, I'll take the L, have a little extra time to, like, talk to my friends that I haven't seen in a while or, 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 or grab a beer or, you know, actually get to eat <laughs> right, <laughs> at, at the yeah. restaurant, right? Like, uh, that's fine. But, but that's, I mean, that's where I think the health of this game that should be the target, you know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not so concerned about like hyper competitive stuff, but like bringing that water level up, uh, sure. consistently uh, in the middle. That that fat metal, that half, that the the grassroots, the blue collar Age of Sigmar, the working, right. the working the class. Working age yeah, of Sigmar. yeah. The the uh, the proletariat Age of Sigmar. I mean, that's what we need to focus on. Um, well, uh, Alex, any any final uh, soapbox moments? Anything you want to put on blast? Anything you want to shout out? Uh, I, if people are interested, do check out the Pants Mafia AOS YouTube channel. Uh, Christian has put up some games recently playing Flesh Eater Courts where he has gotten his ass handed to him <laughs> by Tanya. So 
definitely worth a look. He's also taken some really interesting, almost Alex-esque builds. Um, I think he had one with four engines of the gods, and he was just trying to summon Soros the whole game. Even got Tanya in on it, and she took the Smash Bat uh, Flesh Eater Cord build. Amazing. Which I feel as a community, we can do better than Smash Bat. So that is a challenge. I will put that out there to all of you. Um, <laughs> I, I have so far come up with Bat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, uh, there was another good one, but I forgot amazing but, <laughs> so, so uh, that's my challenge out there to you don't let smash bat be good enough we can do better everyone yeah so we need a better name than than smash bat is what you're saying <laughs> yes yes we can do this we we have the puns we have the technology i i feel uh, like there's one in there with with bats in the belfry like mm -hmm. bats in the what is it shyish what what are there's got to be something there's got to be something that sounds belfry-esque yeah. Uh, man. man, oh, it's just eluding me. Um, yeah. So, so Archer, I had something. <laughs> um, so yeah, check out Pants Mafia AOS on YouTube. Um, I obviously, give you a follow on Twitter for some of your uh, arid thoughts. Uh, or can they follow you? You can follow me at Moderate Pants. Yeah, uh, that's, that is the role I play in the Pants Mafia to be the voice of moderation. So you can see how well that's going based on our discussion. <laughs> Uh, and, but yeah, you can follow me at uh, at moderate pants. Yep. And, and uh, uh, by all means, if anyone, I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. No, no, keep going, keep going. Would like to reach out privately about anything mental health related. By all means, you are always welcome to do that. Um, I'd be happy to help people navigate. You know, how do I get set up with the therapist? You know, how does insurance work? Those sorts of general questions I can help you navigate. So by all means, you're welcome to reach out. Anything more specific than that, I might, you know, refer you back to your own mental health professional, but always happy to help if anyone is in need. Yeah, right on, right on. And uh, thank you so much for being on, uh, Alex. This is, every time you come on, it's just, I know it's going to be a blast. Uh, we're going to talk weird, wacky lists. We're going to, we're going to go down some tangents about video games and uh, we're going to, uh, we're going to kind of land on a topic that I think is super important. We don't talk about nearly enough uh, as gamers, as, uh, you know just our mental health and uh, being visible and being trying to make healthy decisions because, you know, we, I think it's pretty ubiquitous that people are trying to live healthier, like with their diets and exercise. And, you know, this seems like there's nerds working out all the time on my feed, but actually exercise sure. some, some compassion, uh, compassionate behaviors and mindfulness. I think that that's the next piece of just making the world a little bit better place. So uh, thank you so much for being on. Um, Chat gang, you are the show within the show. You're the reason we do this thing. Remember to drink your milk, pay your taxes, and uh, you know, visit a blood bank or something. Uh, for those, uh... <laughs> go, go do something kind for yourself. Ask yourself what you need, and remember, it is okay to feel what you feel. Right on, right on. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.